Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience today. Blood and guts should have been named gall and bile. We're going to dissect the effort from the garbage pail kids like a frog in science class. Plus, we're going to check in as the bloodline turns, and we're going to collide with AEW's wrestling program. All that and more today, and to join me. Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's the man who analyzes blood and guts with surgical precision, the great Brian Last, everybody. Conan! <laughs> Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again for another fun edition. Conan has become the new Hey Derek. Conan! <laughs> Conan! <laughs> Oh, it's just, it's a jackass mentality with these idiots at this point. It is like, hey, Rocky, watch me pull a screwdriver out of my ass. You know, it's like those shows that you like. I don't even know if they're still on. What? What? No, you know that Tosh, what's his name? Daniel Tosh, the Tosh show that was on. Ta Tosh.0, Tosh. Oh, haven't seen that in ages. What's happened to him? He should have been a, a bigger name. But like that and ridiculousness, all these things, there could be one of those daily about the wrestling business nowadays. Cool, well, because that's they're all auditioning. They don't want to be on their own television program. They want to be on stupid videos. Uh, anyway, I, I hey, you apologize. Know what? Well, go ahead. What were you going to say? My demo for my match lost 80,000 viewers, but 2 million people watched me fall on my head on YouTube. <laughs> That's the mentality nowadays. You know, yeah, I can't draw any money, but I'm on fire on the internet. Um, but I was I, I apologize if I am verklempt, bum fuzzled, and possibly even kerfluffled today, because I've I've had another one of those schedules this week, Brian, and I am I'm sleep deprived. And I'm I'm not sure, and especially because we're doing this program the start of it before the end of it has actually occurred. It's one of those type of deals. We're in time travel again because I have had four hours of sleep night before last, four hours of sleep last night, and I'm going to get four hours of sleep tonight. And I ain't used to that at my advanced age and with my normal schedule that I've been keeping, but I got another one of those projects that will become public knowledge at a point in the near future, and we'll talk about it, but it's been... Porn. So we've been, oh, quit. Wouldn't take me that long. Don't be long. embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. You can tell well, people it's porn. It it wouldn't take me that long to shoot these days. Well, no pun intended, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately, be nothing but puns. It, uh, it puns, <laughs> buns, and fun. That's my, but no, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing anything requiring me to take, to disrobe. Uh, but it, it is requiring me to not sleep. So I apologize for being in uh, a state of limbo today, but it's easier, I guess, being in this sleep deprived, confused condition to watch what we watched and Twitter blew up. We'll talk about it later on, but for once Twitter blew up with a massive outpouring of what the fuck is this shit? The AEW followers usually try to, you know, balance that out. But I saw a lot of, uh, Jesus Christ, how much more can we put up with this? But we'll talk about that later on. But I want to talk about who I've been putting up with, Brian, real briefly. The fine customers of Cornette's Collectibles. Over the last few weeks, so the orders, especially for the T-shirt, it's the hottest shirt on AEW television, the Cornette Face T-shirt. Uh, but they've been pouring in, and the feather bottoms are flying with their various order filling. <laughs> feather bot flying feather bottoms. Hey, they used to they used to do a circus act also. Anyway, they're uh, <laughs> they're fulfilling all these or flying orders. And I just want you to know that if you want something over the next few weeks, then please avail yourself of the fine merchandise at Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. But in a couple of weeks, we're going to have some great news on the, you know, me, many people, me included, have called me the merchandise master because I'm tuned into what the cult of Cornette and what the wrestling fans would like to buy and purchase and read and watch and view and listen to and put on their shelf, and own, and et cetera. 
and we are about to enter into the crowning achievement. Porn. God damn it. That was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But the crowning achievement, I say to you, Brian Last, before I crown you, was <laughs> King, King Dong Last. Oh. Um, anyway, the crowning achievement of Cornette's Collectibles merchandise line is coming up in a couple of weeks. The announcement will be made, and we'll keep you posted on that at jimcornett.com and here on the program. But this brings me to something, Brian, because... You know, we've got the crew of Cult of Cornet uh, Fan Fest watchers, right, out there. They they have the attire, the swords or sabers, the sash, the beret, the the shirt, the ni- whole nine yards. Well, the saber's been somewhat optional depending on the venue lately, but we've seen a few photos. Of course, there's Nick in Canada. There was a woman who sent in photos recently of her at an AEW event wearing the outfit. I don't remember her name, so she's just a woman. <laughs> As opposed to a person, she wasn't even, she was a fine looking young lady is what she was. I saw the picture right. and it's like you, you're painting her like a matronly Alice ghostly type. And no, she was a fine young example of woman flesh. Uh, but no, well, the same also. <laughs> yes. Just run this by Steven. I haven't slept. I'm so fucking tired. <laughs> and I'm losing my voice. Um, but what I'm trying to say to you is even the Saber has been approved in Canada. Cause that do you remember? That's why Tiger Jeet Singh was so over in Ontario. They had a large population in Ontario was in the 70s. I assume it's that way today, of whatever nationality or religion or whatever it was that Tiger Jeet Singh represented. And and since this was back in the 70s, we were reading the fan club bulletins of the time. It wasn't like anybody was going into great detail in these global relationships, but a lot of his people were up there. And at one of the smaller shows in Ontario, not Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, they actually the fans got in a fight in the parking lot with each other with fucking sabers. No shit. And it was in a newspaper. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> yes. That was like almost 50 years ago, but I remember that plain as shit. I was like, they were fighting with somebody in Ontario. You know, one of the Hall of Greg Oliver, somebody slam wrestling. Look that up. God damn it. Anyway, I brought up the Cult of Cornet Fan Fest watchers because I got an email from Eddie in Buffalo. And he says the cult has been growing on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Patreon, you name it, we're on it. More and more of us are bumping into each other out there in the world. Now, as a Buffalo Bills fan, we here in Bills Mafia have a simple greeting. When we see another Bills fan in Bills garb, we simply say, Go Bills! And they reply in kind. No more needs to be done or said. If someone doesn't reply in kind or say the right phrase back, aspersions are cast on them immediately. Star Wars fans wish each other the force be with you. Star Trek fans throw up live long and prosper. So with the ever-expanding cult, sadly not everyone is going to be found in the complete official convention watcher attire. He says swords are not accepted in many places and finding a white beret is a lot harder than you would think. Apparently that is true. Finding a white beret is not the easiest. That's why we've had the chef's hat and the Pillsbury Doughboy things, but that's part of it. Coming soon to jimcornette.com. What, the Pillsbury Doughboy chef's hats or the white beret? The white beret. It's the ballad of the white beret. Anyway. You can embroider everyone's name on it? You know, you could actually do it around in circles and then up on top and... um. But anyway, but bumping into someone in a corny branded shirt is very likely, especially at wrestling-centric events, no matter what the company. So I think the logical next step for the rapidly growing cult is that we should adopt an official greeting. Something short, sweet, and something that lets one know they are among friends, real pro wrestling fans, decent human beings who utilize their left and right turn indicator type of friends. 
So what should our official greeting to one another be? That's what we got to come up with here, Brian. What do you think? It has to be something that lifts up the fellow member, lets them know that they have support, but also shows what they are supporting. Hmm. How about this? Like a battle cry, maybe? Well, I know it's it's a greeting. Oh, how about that? Well, that's the battle cry. Whenever they, <laughs> once that they have greeted each other at the conventions and fan fests and wrestling events, and they know who's on whose side, then they amass together in one glob in the middle of the building, and then they emit the cornet, cult of cornet battle cry, and then they disperse in all directions to batter about the head and face all the uh, fucking play wrestling fans and the the fans of the Buckaroos and things of that nature. It could be a big goddamn schmoz all over the convention floor. Well, that's the the convention floor. That's the uh, battle cry here in Chicago at the convention. But the, but the greeting to to disseminate disseminate to discern or eliminate or gesticulate the 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 wheat from the chaff as they say reggie's dead no come on hey reggie's dead because that'll cause the other people to like get away from it what the fuck's this guy saying now loud well that may that is actually that's our version of kayfabe reggie's dead Reggie's dead. Wow, this is if, cool. we're getting the whole terminology today. If somebody comes into the group or the conversation or the immediate <laughs> vicinity of the area that you think is a fan of the Buckaroos or Twinkle Toes or Tony or whoever the case, people we don't want uh, poisoning our atmosphere with their toxicity, then we say Reggie's dead. And immediately everybody disperses. That's brilliant. Yeah. All right, but that's but not the, the greeting. greeting. That's not the greeting. I've got the greeting. Uh oh. The greeting is when you walk up to a someone and you go, thank you, then they should, at the same time as you, hold up their middle finger to yours and go, fuck them, and then entwine middle fingers, a la a pinky swear, and go, bye. See? Thank you. Fuck them. Bye! With a fucking intertwined middle finger. You thought this out and you visualize human beings doing it, not cartoons? Yes! Intertwined middle fingers and you say fuck at the same time? Fingers. Yes. If somebody walks up to you and says... <laughs> thank you? Thank you. As soon as they say thank you, you should give their middle finger to their face in the hope that they do the same? <laughs> and say fuck you. And if they, God damn <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna work. I mean, and you say fuck you. <laughs> if they say fuck you back with a fitter twine finger, <laughs> then you. They could intertwine that well, finger into your that eye. Be even better. I was, I was thinking fuck them because you twin intertwine the the middle fingers and. And spread it out, but that'd be even better. Thank you, fuck you, <laughs> bye. <laughs> if they don't hold up the middle finger and intertwine it with yours and say fuck you at the same time, they'll do it shortly afterwards, right before they punch you in the face. <laughs> you know, maybe the battle cry would be a better uh, idea. Just go right to war. <laughs> Just go right to war. <laughs> Just ha! Oh. Swarm, swarm, uh, swarm, swarm, Conan! <laughs> Conan! Conan! <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we'll work on all of that, but we've we've made some good, solid progress there with the terminology amongst the well, cult and public to identify themselves. The only thing I kind of question still is the fact that we're calling them Cornet Fan Fest watchers because it appears they're going to actual wrestling events. So maybe the word Fan Fest is a little. Too specific. Too specific, but also false advertising. Well, no, but it's not false because they can be at FanFest, but it's, it's not complete advertising because they can be so much more. So I think we're... Cult of Cornet Wrestling Integrity Watchers. Ooh. Woo. <laughs> Woo. W-I-W. Woo. Our wooers out there. Have you... you <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have a staff, a, a legion of wooers that would go out and 
and keep an eye on things in your name, Brian? Well, first of all, I think Ric Flair may have the trademark on wars and uh, no, wars he doesn't and have anything to do with about. WIW. W-I- where, where are you getting WIW from? Wrestling Integrity Watchers. Oh, Wrestling Woo. Integrity Watchers. Woo. Woo. Eh. I mean, if you're going to abbreviate it, you need it to be better than that. You're stealing about, someone else's thing. Okay, how about fuck you? Well, Cult of Cornette is COC. Cockwatchers. Cockwoo. <laughs> Cockwoo. Cockwoo. Cockwoos. Okay. <laughs> now, see, now, you know, we spitball things and we come up with the people it's like that are Eddie dressing. Grimm's office. This is great. That are, the people that are dressing in these outfits and going to these shows are now going to be called official cockwoos. We Did understand we... if you guys don't want to go out anymore in these outfits and have your photos <laughs> taken. <laughs> That's another one of those cockwoos. But if you're undercover, of course, just say Reggie's dead. Could we get a could we get a chant going cockwoo, cockwoo, cockwoo? Is that one side or is that one side does cock and the other side does woo? Well, it depends on the side that has the cock or the other side woos. And it's not a Ric Flair woo. There's no like woo. It's just woo. No woo. Just woo. W-I-W. Yeah. <laughs> hey, should we start the real show now? Have we practiced enough? I think so. If that's I what told this you is. I was tired. Yeah. All right, let's get serious. Let's get serious. Let's get serious and fall in love. Who was that, Mr. Music Expert? Oh, I don't know. I thought you were going to go with Olivia Newton-John first with Let's Get Physical, but you're not serious. No, don't deflect and conflict from the question I asked you. You're about to reveal that you don't know the answer to something. Don't tell me how to deflect, but uh, I don't know who that is. Yeah, who was that? Let's Get Serious. Was that not Jermaine Jackson? Oh, that's why I don't know. Because I don't care about Jermaine Jackson. <laughs> he's the one that stayed. No, he's with, the one that left. No, he's the one that left because he married... Barry was, Gordy's daughter. Barry Gordy's daughter, and then that whole thing went south. Okay. Anyway. That's why I think it was... Where was it? I think it was like Motown 25 when they did the big thing where Michael Jackson did Thriller. Or not Thriller, but when he did Billie Jean and the Moonwalk for the first time. He thanked... He goes, it was so much fun being with my brothers and Jermaine. You know, like even, <laughs> even Jermaine. Like there was always heat. <laughs> uh, all right. But anyway, let's get serious. Yeah. And go to pay tribute to some of our fallen friends with another edition of Reggie's Corner. <laughs> Reggie's Corner We're here to talk about your good boys and girls Reggie's Corner We're so sorry they're dead now Well, once again, Matt O'Donnell is guilty, responsible, whatever the terminology is, but nevertheless I picture someone slaughtering Scooby-Doo when I hear that noise You have some strange... Bedtime fantasies. I've been hanging out with you. Anyway, I got an email from Stefan. I believe that's how you would pronounce it. S-T-E-P-H-O-N. Stefan. Stefan. Right? Stefan. 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 In, hey, Steph. In Cleveland, uh, obviously Ohio, there probably isn't another one. Well, Tennessee. Anyway, uh Unfortunately, his 12-year-old pit bull, Roxy, was diagnosed with cancer in March, and she was running around the yard playing and wagging her cute little tail until July the 9th. He lost her then. She wasn't eating, and her mobility was compromised. But he said, Roxy was my best friend in the world. She always slept in my bed, hogging the covers, leaving me to freeze my ass off. And it would mean the world to me if Roxy could be added to Reggie's corner. And Roxy has a prominent place Stefan we're sorry to hear about that but she again had a happy life with plenty of covers um Fred you know any what, women named Roxy in your life um the the girl wrestler in that uh, worked in TNA in the late 2000s was named Roxy well I didn't watch TNA in the late 2000s. I don't know if that was her the real late name. 2000s 
the late 2000s. They're they're dead now. We're so sorry. They're dead now. <laughs> anyway, um, did I say Fred? Well, Fred, he also goes as Butch, apparently, from Kansas City, and that's in Missouri. I think we're going to pretty much narrow that one down. Or Kansas. Um, well, it's in... It's in Missouri as well as Kansas. This happens to be in Missouri. Okay. You're right, and I'm right too. God damn it. Anyway, don't try to distract from the issue. Uh, that He and his wife lost Beauregard the Wonder Dog, Bo for short, to cancer. He was almost five years old, and that's terrible, a young puppy like that. But uh, they got him at a rough time in their life. He was... Is his father had health issues, Butch's, not Bo's. And uh, so they've been together ever since. And he was had a rough go of it because he was an adopted dog and they had found him and rescued him and everything. But again, we wanted to put Bo in a prominent spot in Reggie's corner. And, and Butch, a.k.a. Fred, we're sorry to hear about that. Um. Uh, what what's the matter with you now? Butch, aka Fred. I don't know why I find that funny. Well, I do. I do, you know he's identifying himself by a couple of different pronouns or whatever. So, uh, also from Brandon, uh, on July sixth at four twenty five, my wife and I said good goodbye to our cat Cody. He was seventeen years old and the most loving boy you had ever seen. He was also mischievous and stubborn, and he would. Be all okay when bedtime rolled around and he would be waiting for you under the blanket. And he was as old, apparently, as his, as uh, Brandon and his wife's marriage. They got him at the same time. So, sorry to hear about Cody. Um, and then we've got to do a retroactive entry in Reggie's Corner from Kevin from Richmond. Retroactive? Yes, because... He wanted to recognize the first dog that he ever had, named Max, and he passed away 30 years ago this week. It's an anniversary. Uh, his mother, Kevin's mother, that is, rescued him from a Safeway parking lot, and he was like a shepherd, collie, lab, mutt mix, and he loved Big Max and would steal him whenever he was allowed just one bite. And outside of that, he would only eat Alpo. <laughs> Who's giving him what? bites? Of, why is he giving him bites of the Big Mac? His brother. His brother was give, is a big old boy. He was giving him bites of the Big Mac, and he would steal the whole Big Mac out of his brother's hand. You've never done that? Just give your puppy just the one bite, and they take the whole thing? I've never given my dog a Big Mac, no. Just a bite of anything, and they take the whole thing. No, I, the thing I'm holding in my hand? No, I don't let yeah. go of it. You know, you both might be sitting on the couch there together. And Fido or Rover or Beauregard or whoever <laughs> yeah. might want a fucking bite of your ham and cheese sandwich. Well, you don't want to get up and go all the way in there and leave the TV just to make Rover a, a, his own ham and cheese sandwich. You just give him a bite. Hey, what do you know about the wrestler Beauregard? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Move it on. Outside of that, the Big Macs, he would only eat Alpo wet food and scowl if you tried anything different. Kevin, we're sorry about Max 30 years ago. Okay, this one. Yeah, well, hold on, yeah, and it's a hold retroactive on. thing from 30 years ago? Well, it's an anniversary, and it was his first dog. You never forget your first, even if you're just holding its head. But now I've got another email here. We've got to expand our species list for Reggie's Corner. And I got to be honest with you, when I first got this email, I wasn't sure. Well, th this is obviously, he's William from Gloucester, England. He's from the UK over there. And they do have a few different words and spellings and things than what we people over here, what invented the English language to begin with, us Americans do. And a lot of people don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. Well, William wrote, a few months back, my late grandfather passed, and I took upon, I thought he meant, I, I took upon the anus, but I see it's O-N-U-S. It took upon the onus, the responsibility, the, the burden, the... <laughs> my grandfather died, I took upon, <laughs> I took the, upon anus. the anus. <laughs> what? Well, sorry about Grandpa. <laughs> 
I took upon the onus of providing a new home for the love of his life, <laughs> Freddie. <laughs> the and then I thought this word at first was budgeter, Freddie the budgeter. But then when I typed it into the interweb machine, hold on, I got to pull that up. I find that it is a budger iger, a budger iger. Which is, Brian, do you know what a budger iger is? I have no idea. I don't even know if you're joking or not. I'm not joking. I If I'm lying, I'm flying and my feet ain't left to ground. A budger iger, B-U-D-G-E-R-I-G-A-R, is a small and gregarious Australian parakeet that in the wild is green with a yellow head. It is popular as a pet bird and has been bred in a variety of colors. Budger Iger. So, let me clear that off never to read that again. So, <laughs> the definition of budge, Budger Iger. Yeah. So, we're getting back to William's email. Yeah. His late grandfather died leaving Freddy the Budger Iger at loose ends. But he had and, an anus. And he took upon the anus and the rest of him. <laughs> Uh, providing a new home because uh, Freddie was the love of his grandfather's life. Now, we don't know to this day if he was male or female, but that's beside the point. Isn't I it? gave him a good home and allowed him to fly free on appointed occasions. A couple weeks back, I made the <laughs> foolish decision to take a vacation and asked my Aunt Sally to look after him. I ensured arrangements were made that he could maintain his routine of free flight time. Three days into my vacation, I had a call from Aunt Sal. I was aware it was unlikely good news, as I didn't foresee her calling me for anything else. She broke the news that whilst cleaning Freddy's cage, he had flown out an open window. Whilst I was pleased attempts were made to maintain his home, I was slightly angered by the event that had evidently occurred. I, of course, tried to enjoy my last couple of days of vacation before I made haste on returning to search for Freddy. So, boy, he was so broke up, he left after only two days. The days on the beach wasn't the same, watching the seagulls being reminded where Freddy could be. I uploaded notifications on social media, which was shared by lots of good Samaritans. However, alas, I had no news. Although it was clear, Freddy... The Budger Iger had touched hearts. To compound the issue, Freddy's dead. Do 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 do. That's what I said. Freddy had also recently lost his beloved Budger Iger long-term partner, Belinda. So I can only assume he and now we've established that we're not positive of the gender. So this could have been a lesbian relationship. Belinda could have been a man. He seems like this guy doesn't know anything about what's going on with this animal. Well, there you go. You don't know who's who's pitching and who's catching. A man. Not, I guess not a man. It wouldn't be a man bird. <laughs> it, it would be a... <laughs> a male bird. There's a good thing. That bird is a man. There's a group of birds and a man. Uh, <laughs> oh, God damn you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, this is serious. We're supposed to be serious. Let's get serious. <laughs> We're talking about a missing bird here. Would you stop? So he had recently lost his beloved Budger Iger long-term partner, Belinda. Belinda Carlisle, I assume. So I can only assume he may have been in a bad place. So now it's, it's, it could have been possible he just flew out to end it all. Upon reflection, it was selfish of me to leave Freddie alone. Well, you think, William? I then had the neighbor a couple doors down knock on my door. I could tell by her face good news seemed again unlikely. I was made aware of a specimen loosely resembling Freddie's description in her garden. I went to see, and although a devoured carcass, I knew Freddie when I saw him. She offered to dispose of him, presumably in the garbage, which was no appropriate end for my Fred. I took him out and buried him in the bottom of the garden within the confine of a recently finished box of upmarket chocolates. 
Not all stories have an unhappy end, however. I have now purchased a new pair of Budger Rigers, P.S. Hayes and Jimmy, after the free birds who Freddy so apparently wished to live his life like. I would have more of the beautiful creatures to complete the group. However, I'm not working a, men a menagerie here. Thank you and God bless William from Gloucester. Not, Ma not like Michael and Terry or Michael and Buddy, Michael and Jimmy. Yeah, P.S. and Jim, P.S.A.'s and Jimmy. Yeah. William of Gloucester. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes for this week another edition, bless them all, of Reggie's Corner. This has been Reggie's Corner. Goodbye to our friends on the other side. On the next Reggie's Corner, we'll talk about a bunch more pets who died. Well, there it is, the gong that signifies the end of the untasteful part of the program. Now we get oh. to the toxicity. Oh, I think it's only it's only beginning. Uh, but we want to once again thank Richard Cheese has nothing there on Matt. Ooh, ooh, though, before we go any further, we got to remind the folks. Come through titty. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Thank you, Joey Ross. That's right. Um, we got to remind the folks, along with Fred Gwynn, that... If you missed the drive through this past week, seek it out, or very soon the clip will be on YouTube where we tell the story of Con Man Colin, the guy that owes us a lot of money, that is the one who screwed up the enjoyment of our listeners for a few months with his various misdeeds that we talk about at great detail, uh, and we want you to make sure to hear about that, and also follow him and Talk to him on social media, right, Brian? No, serious inquiries only, but let him know what you think. Let him know what you think about his way of conducting himself in business and his way of taking money and, well, we don't know where he put it, actually. Taking, taking money from one place and putting it in another place that it's not supposed to go. And he didn't just do that to us. He did it to a bunch of people. Where did that money go? That's the big question, and that's the big answer that we're going to have. Stay tuned for future editions of Does Colin Thompson Owe You Money right here on the show. But yeah, go to YouTube, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. That is there with the official Travis Heckle artwork. And of course, all the other videos you can share, like, check out, full episodes, clips of the episodes, and Omnibus Collections, the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Okay, Don West deals. You didn't have to go into a commercial there when I was just <laughs> mentioning a programming note, for heaven's sake. But yes, Con Man Colin, and we give all of his... Colin Thompson, let's say his full Con name so people Colin know. Colin Thompson, with no P, because we took the P out of him in this particular <laughs> segment. And uh, we give all of his information also, as, as well as... <laughs> I imagine we'll probably be putting some of the lawsuit documents up at some point on jimcornette.com for public perusal when that goes into discovery but anyway check that out and um i had somebody send but before we go into gall and bile review and boy the people were again that's something they were wanting to hear about because they couldn't believe their eyes but a a listener sent me this, Brian, and I'm not going to take credit for it, not because I'm trying to dodge heat, but because I don't want to take credit for somebody else's work. And at the same time, I don't know if they wrote it or they just sent it to me, so I'm not crediting anyone's names, but there's a new Christmas carol that even though it's the middle of summer and it's 87 degrees outside, I feel like it's time after this past Wednesday night for a new Christmas carol to be officially adopted by the cult of Cornette. Brian, would you like to hear it? Uh, it is July, Christmas in July, I guess. Sure. It's called Tony the Snowman. Oh, no. Tony the Snowman has a holly jolly soul with a rolled up bill and a real red nose and pupils <laughs> like black holes. Tony the Snowman dreams a fairy tale today. His booking's bad and the content's sad, but they'll beat WWE one day. He thinks there is some magic when the snow goes up his nose. <laughs> or when he takes a little sniff, he thinks he books like Rhodes. Oh, Tony the Snowman, he's alive as he could be. 
He jumps and shouts and stomps around, hugging talent awkwardly. Wow, that was actually really good. We appreciate the fine person who sent that in, whether they wrote it or not. They just don't want their name out there? I don't know. I know it was a completely anonymous. A locker room thing. musician? It was one of those meme things the, that they sent rather than just writing it in an email. So I don't know where it came from. Ah. It's in public domain. Oh, okay. Speaking of public dumb main, <laughs> this. <laughs> what a this, transition. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> AEW on Wednesday night, July the 19th, broadcast, although they were narrow casting to the lowest common denominator, they broadcast their blood and guts television special. And I'm going to give credit at the top of the program to your friend and mine and the friend of all serious wrestling fans, Brian Solomon. Did you see his tweet after the main event had concluded? I think so. I don't remember it verbatim, though. I have it right here. Jesus, you certainly do. I wrote it down. He said, I long for the fabled day when one of the two major companies can put on a war games in which the participants actually know how to work the match without props and it doesn't turn into Gallagher with blood. All they were missing was the watermelon and the sledgehammer. (sighs) That's a great way of putting it. Gallagher with blood. Gallagher with blood is what we've come to. (laughs) It's it. The best wrestling match in the history of goddamn tag team wrestling practically was on a fucking the same company's television show last Saturday night, and then they let these brain-warped children go out there and, you know, one team wants to be video game heroes and not champions of playing video games, but actual heroes in the video games. And the other is captained by a fucking murder porn junkie. What do you think you're going to get? But we didn't get that first. Oh, no. Not first, we didn't. We have finally got a new persona for Jungle Jackoff. Now, who was the... (laughs) What the fuck was going on with him burying a body in the desert and then riding out in a apparently hitchhiked limousine? It wasn't there when he was there. It didn't bring him. It pulled up after he was already out in the middle of the desert burying a body that we never saw on his entrance video. And I'll discuss that in a second, and it was stupid, but it would have (laughs) been a little more tolerable if the limo pulls up, the door opens, and there's Anna Jay's legs. Come on in, big boy. Let's go to the arena. Something to justify any of this. But no, it was, I guess, in a very theatrical fashion. They played the Jungle Boy music. They stopped it. He must have said, stop. Play this. I gave them a video of him burying himself, burying oh, Jungle Jesus Boy Christ. in the desert so he could move on to Beethoven's Fifth. Well, I know. I just... I. <sighs> I hear the music and I'm looking at my notepad and petting Harley on the fucking belly. And suddenly I look up and this fucking idiot's in the desert burying an unknown corpse. And I'm like, they're very symbolic there, aren't they? It's almost cruel burying Jungle Boy in the desert. Not the jungle. Not the jungle. The desert. He he should have been laid to rest in the Amazonian rainforest where cheetah could piss on him and fertilize the area and they could grow a whole new crop of jungle boys tony's got a budget it should have been jack perry in a helicopter throwing jungle boy into the rainforest there you go they could add darby allen shoot it anyway so he comes out now and he's got black leather on and he looks a lot better as a person than the fucking you know, the loincloth, but he's still not very intimidating to to look at because he's not that intimidating, but he looks better. But then as soon as I wrote a note that not very intimidating, did you see he got in the face of a six-year-old boy in the front row and tried to fucking make him flinch and couldn't make the and kid laugh at him? Yeah, he, he actually made the he, move to make him flinch and the kid didn't yes. even break. Yeah, a six-year-old. He wasn't as tall as the rail. 
And the six-year-old was short, short himself. Anyway, so the, it was the FTW title on the line, another belt, this one actually not even officially recognized. We've gone over that a million times. And the confrontation between Hook and Jungle Jack, or well now Jack Perry, and Hook comes out, he acts like he doesn't give a shit, but in a good way. He's got the fucking demeanor, right? You know, it, but at the same point, visually, instead of making either one of these guys special, Jungle Boy was special in terms of, as a baby face, he could be smaller than the heel, and at least if the heel beat him up, he could sell or whatever. And Hook's a small guy now himself because he's still... Young and not full grown, but God damn it, it looks such smallness and youngness lookingness. This looked like, what was that, Matt Rats they tried to do with teenage wrestlers in Calgary years ago. But nevertheless, it gets for the younger crowd. So he's trying. He really is trying. Old, old Jack. He's trying to be a heel. I think he's approaching it like he approached being a babyface. He's playing a part rather than he's just a real natural fucking personality, but it's better. They did a ridiculous spot where Hook Northern Lights suplexed Jack off the apron to the floor. <laughs> At least both of them sold. But goddamn, 10 seconds later, Jack was giving Hook a DDT on the floor. And then Hook beat the count. So they got to get that in there. I like Hook's style. I like his throws. I like his judo influence. This wasn't a rotten match as modern matches go with the psychology where you don't really have a fucking leader to ground, ground it and play off of. Um, Hook's got a great German suplex with a bridge. And then... Even, it, <laughs> Hook went for another one. Jack grabbed the referee to distract him and mule kicked Hook in the balls, hit him with an elbow, and got a two count. So the balls don't work anymore. I and then yeah, the balls don't work anymore. And no, I'm, I don't mean his balls won't work now. I mean that doesn't work to kick somebody in the balls. And then Jack got the title belt and brought it in the ring, and the referee saw it plain as day, and they had a tug of war with it. Oh, Paul Turner, and then suddenly the referee turned away for no reason and went to yell at someone outside the ring that wasn't there. Just some awkward motion like, oh, I've got to be over here now. And Jack swings the belt, hook ducks, grabs Jack and they crush the referee in the corner. And now the referee is going to be dead from 275 pounders mashing him in the corner. And Hook suplexes Jack and covers him, but there's no referee. And then they have, I don't know whether they didn't walk through this or I don't know whether just somebody thought it, but they have Hook go over and it's like he's checking roadkill. He's just poking and shaking the referee like come around and this he didn't take a fucking chair to the head he was smushed in the corner it might knock the breath out of him his brain's still working he can open his eyes and and see he can see the light he's not been blinded by the light ripped off like a deuce another runner in the night not like that no thank no God. So Hook's trying to wake him up like an idiot, and it doesn't work. So then he turns around, and Jack hits him with the belt. Cover, one, two, three. So they they haven't been beating Hook until they figure out a way to make him look like a moron and then beat him. What would you think? I think Manford Mann and Bruce Springsteen should both sue. What did you think... I'm all for giving this a chance. Hollywood Jack Perry. Sunglasses, hair pulled back, douchebag, hates the fans, doesn't try to pick on a fan, tries to pick on a kid, and it backfires. <laughs> but the music, what do you think of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony being used 
I don't, I don't understand. It doesn't seem like it fits. Well, it's not even, it, it, he's not Hollywood Jack Perry with a black leather jacket. He's Magnum, one of Magnum T.A.'s discarded sperm. Magnum with, J.P. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm so, you've got a guy who used to be Jungle Boy, who everybody knows is really the son of a Hollywood actor of some repute. And, but then when he switches heel, instead of being Hollywood Jack Perry, He's a kind of a biker, surly Jack Perry coming out to entrance music consisting of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That makes, you know, the Hell's Angels, that's what they used to fucking play whenever they'd ride into town to cause chaos in them black leather jackets. Dun, 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 dun. But, you know, that's the thing. Like, having some kind of grand music for a heel to be booed is one thing, the nature of the piece isn't really dun 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 dun, and then he comes out dun 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 dun, and then it takes a while to build, and it's all still happening. Go ahead, it's still happening. Like again, it works for like Claudio. You know what I mean? Like there's certain people it could work for. What about a fifth of Beethoven? Walter Murphy, the disco version. There you go. Memphis. There, you, I, I'm just telling you. Z. Walter Murphy's going to sue now. I think somebody ought to sue over that finish. But besides that, should we move on? Yeah. Did you like Officer Bar Brady catching a secret meeting between Jericho and Don Fallis in the restaurant, and the security man having to <laughs> eject him? You know, I don't even know what to pick on first the ridiculousness of the entire idea or actually i do know what to pick up first marvez is acting yes marvez is unbearable because he's so like even some of the people in wrestling who try to act you can lose yourself maybe for a second him it's just over the top I'm a wrestling announcer, and there's crazy things happening. Let's go see what we can find out. Yeah, and, and you know, it's not even, it's it's phony. It's not over the top. It's, it's, it's not over the, the top. It's, it's in the middle, but, but over the top at the same time. He's not, it, it, it's his natural television personality, apparently. And it's the worst I've ever seen. On any local TV people doing news on cable, Spectrum Channel 1. Are more professional. It, it, he doesn't need to do this. I'm here in the restaurant. We're going to try to capture them. Oh, look, we could do it just by turning to the left. Have no turning to the left, here. and there they are. <laughs> and it, it's like the fucking in the fucking seventies cop shows when you could follow somebody twenty feet behind them and they'd never see you, and you'd never lose them in traffic. This is all Jericho unleashed. That's what this is. Marvez Callis with Jericho. This is all Jericho. Well, but there, there's there's more to come. Okay, let's talk about what they're doing with our boy. And I, I think he's got Stockholm Syndrome at this point because he's, he's clearly loving it. He's all the way on board with this. But MJF, the AEW World Heavyweight Champion, the guy that is theoretically supposed to be carrying the money matches in the main event of the pay-per-views, along with CM Punk, who is, as we mentioned, MJF's the biggest star. Punk is the biggest name in the company. The biggest star has to be the world champion. But Punk's the biggest name. But does either one of them need to be doing goddamn Laurel and Hardy? And MJF is now going to, or soon, find out, I think, that you can be a victim of your excessive talent. Everything he does is good <laughs> and entertaining in some kind of way, even if it's even if it's this shit that they're doing, nobody in the world could do this any better than him. However, you'll find out that when you can do everything well, there will be more and more excuses for sales pitches for you to do stupid shit that you ain't got any business doing long term for the health of your goddamn aura if nothing else and as we've said he's he's the people will 
I would think when he becomes a full-fledged devil again, the people will still boo him because they, they know they're supposed to and they appreciate everything he does, so they're going to work with him. But he's rapidly ingratiating himself in a way that people really had some fucking dislike, if not if grudging respect for what he was doing before, but now he's just going to... I don't know. And it's... it. It's not even MJF and Adam Cole interacting with each other in an entertaining and funny way that you could believe is organic between the two of them, but it's obviously a 80s buddy movie takeoff shot like that with scripting and supporting cast and multiple camera angles, and they're just doing this to pull our puds. And I don't think as legitimately believable as he is, he ought to be involved in silliness that's also obviously fake. Talk to me and then we'll talk about the details. I commend your use of the word pud on a wrestling podcast in 2023. Are we talking about the buddy segment or the match? I'm not even sure. Well, the, the buddy segment is what came first. And then the match was shortly to follow. I'll save my match comments for my match comments. I guess with the buddy stuff, like it's not for me. And I agree with what you said before. MJF's really talented. If there was like an MJF 30 minute show with 22 minutes of commercials, just him doing skits or whatever, I would watch it. I'd probably like it if it's good. But in the middle of the wrestling show, I'm not a big fan of these things. Now, again, I'm not a big fan of it. This is one of those things that the AEW fans are reacting to. Every week, it's getting the highest number in the key demo. Every week, the rating for the MJF Cole segment is typically the highest of the show. I got to double check this week because they did have a big match that went close to an hour or whatever it was. Yeah. But I'm not a big fan of this. Now, I think also this let, is... Let me ask you just an editor's note. Yeah. MJF was the highest rated segment of the show a lot of times before he was doing this, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So, okay, never go, continue. Well, the other thing is, I think clearly, like you said, these guys are having a good time with it. And AEW is about nothing if not wrestlers having a good time doing things. So when you say they're talking MJF into it, I would have to think that if he's doing it, it's something he wants to do. Well, no, that's why I said that he's got a little Stockholm syndrome because he's jumped in with both feet. And, and I, I didn't... And, you I know, didn't I, and I think this is also... This is babyface MJF, not, you know, when Moxley and Jericho and various people wanted him to be a babyface, when you started seeing, like, interviews, Jericho is the most prominent one about MJF should be a babyface. It wouldn't have worked then. It's working. The babyface reactions he's getting now are different than what he was getting then, and it's more, the fans are kind of taking to him now, and I think he's kind of going with it. Yes. And long term, uh, because again, the money match still needs to be Punk and MJF. And uh, nevertheless, back who to says this. MJF has to be the heel? Well, depends on where they have it, doesn't it? But we're just oh my god. The point is, I liked the match they had, and and we're not even talking about the match yet. But just as an example of what you were saying. There's a difference in they're going a little fucking far. I'm not saying they shouldn't do a thing where MJF and Adam Cole bond somehow and they're doing the drama with Roddy, Roderick Strong, who's how, Adam, how can you trust this fucking guy? And we've talked about Adam Cole will look like an idiot if MJF stabs him in the back after all this. Adam Cole would probably get over better if he ends up turning heel and joining MJF, if Roddy is the the MacGuffin that allows Adam Cole to turn heel and stab an old friend in the back to go with MJF, that's great. But if Roddy's the one that turns heel on Adam Cole because he's friends with, then that's insane. But I'm not saying they shouldn't do. The other option like is the other option is they all join together. Well, and and then you've got, but they have to be, they pretty much have to be heels to do that. I mean, it, Are they heels right now? No, they're the biggest baby faces. And, and here's the thing. They've, they've come up with a team 
that FTR is going to have to wrestle. It might be the only team that they'll cheer over FTR, or their biggest baby face team in the whole company. It's, ah. But what I'm saying is, I'm not saying they shouldn't do this angle in some kind, and I like the tag team match that they had the other week where they did some basic, simple shit and popped the people. But at the same time, it wasn't blatantly phony and silliness, which this week was. And the bit in Kowloon's, where MJF is taken by Adam Cole to get over his fear of eating spicy food, and then they get drunk, and MJF is telling the story over and over of slamming Big Bill like it was Andre and Hulk, and then they hit the double clothesline on a waiter. They don't really hit it. They're running at the waiter, and you see the freeze frame of the waiter's shocked expression from their viewpoint, and then see them coming, and it's a freeze and fade to black. That's fake. They didn't beat up the waiter at Kowloon. He's, uh, MJF is becoming one of the clowns on the show instead of the ringmaster. And that's the thing. I'm not saying they shouldn't do an angle like this. I'm saying when they do this phony, silly shit that everybody cooperated on, it just drives home into people's mind that this is something they're doing to, to pull our pud. And, you know, maybe we might want to see what's going to happen, but. It makes him one of the clowns instead of the fucking ringmaster, the main event guy that you don't think should be doing obviously phony shit to pull your pud. He should be pulling your pud with shit you can't tell is phony. <sighs> Bar Brady got tipped off that Jericho and Phallus were arriving. And it just so happened that as he was standing in the parking lot saying that he got tipped off that they were arriving, they were pulling up over his left shoulder in their car. And Marvez even runs fake. Did you see him try to run? Seriously, it's not even that he's Jericho's friend. He's Tony's friend. And because of that, they keep jamming him on the show. Marvez from day one when they had him on the mic has not worked. He's not on air or on voice. He should not be a character on this show. And we're not saying he's a bad person. He's been a journalist uh, with a real newspaper for many years now. And everybody likes him. That's not the point. Yeah, when you have to read him, not when you have to watch him. Well, yeah, you shouldn't. You know, if everybody likes your grandma, she shouldn't be interviewing people on national television either. And that's the only qualification he has for this job is that everybody likes him. And he and he's embarrassing himself. And he And it again, makes people look at each other and go, this fucking show. <clears throat> Britt Baker beat Betty Nobody. And then Renee Moxley Good was in the back with Adam Cole and MJF about their match coming up. And Adam says they've caught lightning in a bottle. They're going to win the tag team title. And MJF presents Adam Cole with matching trunks. And Adam Cole presents him with matching jackets. And they start to go out for their match, and Roddy comes in after him like, Adam, Adam, like, come back, Shane. Shane, come back. <clears throat> so now should we talk about the match? Let's talk about the match. The match was MJF and... Adam Cole versus Sammy Guevara and Daniel Garcia, the finals of the Blind Eliminator Tag Team Tournament. Yes, and Jericho was out there for color, although the way he does it these days is more like black and white. Unbearable commentary, show-wide, but especially this match. And MJF and Adam come out and do the exaggerated buddy entrance where now the extra special shockingness is that they didn't transition to Adam Cole's music. He came out to MJF's and they went all the way to the, and MJF was showing his love and gratitude for that. And then MJF and Garcia got in the middle of the ring and started dancing at each other because Garcia did his little, his version of Rick Rude's fucking hip swirl or whatever the fuck it is he's doing. And MJF did it back, and then Garcia, and then MJF, and Garcia, and MJF. And then MJF goes to the floor and goes down to the fake audio board that's set up at ringside to be a fake audio board. 
and presses one button on it. Because, of course, he's also, in addition to being the greatest promo in wrestling and the AEW world champion, he's a goddamn audio engineer. And not only does music start playing, but the lights go down and they get a disco effect. And Garcia and Guevara start dancing with each other. And they do what can only be described, I guess, Brian, as a choreographed duo dance routine that they probably spent a little time on. Would that be an appropriate description of this? I don't know if there is an appropriate description, but that would be a description. That would be a description of what the events that occurred. Uh, propriety be damned. And then MJF starts dancing. And, and of course, the people are loving all of this. For the kind of people who like that kind of thing, those kind of people were in this building. And he dances. I guess, you know, he can sing, he can dance, he can tell jokes, he can... Goddamn, he can core a apple. He can do it all. And then they have Adam Cole. And Adam Cole gets out there and he starts dancing like the male version of Elaine on Seinfeld and gets himself worked up into some kind of fervor where it looked like he was trying to jack off a super so soaker. And then the music stops with a record scratch. That was... <laughs> that was cringy. Where did that come from? Well, because somebody has to even make a hat on a hat. The Let's fake soundboard more cute. The fake soundboard's one thing. A fake record scratch. There's no record player. There's no record being played. It's exactly. Record scratch and Adam Cole still into it, and Garcia and Guevara jump him. And I wrote, "Will this be the first ever MJF segment to run off viewers like a pockets match?" And at this point, I have to say that they had done the impossible and made me not give a shit about MJF. And I, did, I just put this on speed search at that point. Because I, I it, what the fuck? And I'm sure whatever the rest of the shit that they did was, the people in the building loved it. And I'm sure that they're going to continue to love it. But... God damn it, I can't watch this fucking fake silliness with children. It's, if nothing else, disrespectful to the wrestling business, but also, again, long-term, not good. Not good, as Frank Faceman Hickey would say. What did you think of the match and or the dancing and dance fever? What about it, Denny Terrio? You know, I really enjoyed the match last week and the crowd helped make it because they got so into the idea of MJF and Cole and they were reacting to everything against Big Bill and Brian Cage. I really liked that. Yeah. They had a big crowd. I mean, it was Boston. It was their biggest dynamite in a very long time. And it was a hot crowd that would react to a lot of things. And like I said before, I think Adam Cole and MJF must be having a good time with this and they're going to ride that wave and. They're thinking of the now, not any long-term repercussions, which there may or may not be. I mean, who knows? But, you know, I was looking forward to this. I mean, beyond the comedy, the idea of Cole and MJF coming off last week's match working with Guevara and Garcia could have been something, and instead it turned into the dance-off. The Garcia dancing thing, I guess they're trying to get it over. Some adult told him he should start doing that all the time. <laughs> It's one thing when you do it on the entrance. Rick Rude didn't constantly throughout the match gyrate his hips in the face of the fucking wrestlers. It was well, nonstop. And, no, in, in, and it, but in the instances he did, they weren't standing there then doing a goddamn Tennessee do -si do in response to it. We're going to get That's MJF and Cole versus FTR out of this. I'm looking forward to that. I'm hoping we get more of the FTR two out of three falls match kind of milieu and vibe and feel of that match than we do this. But I think on this show, this episode specifically, which was a ridiculous episode, you know, it just felt like it, it worked there, but it didn't work for me at all. I, I, I'm like you. This was kind of one of those very rare These MJF segments where I can't 
I can't say I liked it. I can't pretend it's good. I really, really didn't like it. These were the people who, who come to see the silliness. These are the people who come to see the, the wrestlers that make fun of wrestling. And, the, and they, they appeal to that audience, and then I guess Boston is now a hotbed of that. Yeah. But what, when I was hoping MJF being the world champion should be able to appear on either show, Saturday or Wednesday, I'm thinking after the last few weeks, if they could put MJF on the wrestling show on Saturday night, this thing could be the goddamn best show that anybody's done in years and years on a regular basis. And instead of putting him on the wrestling show, he's driving the clown car. All right. And they got Cole and him working in their t-shirts, which is good. Because beyond <laughs> the fact that apparently it's the best-selling AEW t-shirt of the entire year so far, it covers up any of Cole's issues, so that's good. In that case, I think he ought to wear one of those fucking pleated inflatable wintertime parkas they, they have in the Arctic oh. to give him some upper body. Well, Kenny knows where to get the inflatable thing, so maybe you can check with him. Yeah, the problem is I don't think Kenny has the breath to blow him up anymore. All right, it was one hour, basically, left in the program. And at that point, they had to start gall and bile. I mean, blood and guts. And obviously, because it's War Games rules, if not an actual War Games, that was one of their shortcomings also, you know it's going to go some amount of time because the first two guys have to start and then they stagger the entrances every couple of minutes, etc. So you know that there's it's going to be a long match and go, you know, some level of time because it always has due to the stipulation. But my God, my God, on and on and on and on, the garbage match didn't stop until the break of dawn. And they, again, because they can put, you know, all of Tony's money and resources and that they've got the giant cage and they've got the goddamn production and the big building so that they can do all this shit and they just can't get out of the goddamn rec center. They have to do the narrow-casted, small-minded, indie, outlaw, niche style of wrestling that most people are going to look at and either go, what are these fucking fake kids playing? Or, in the same match, look at these disgusting fucking circus freaks slicing themselves up. And they accomplished both of those things at the same time. You want to go down the play-by-play -play before we discuss the preposterosity of it, Brian? And there was so much preposterosity, or whatever the hell you just said. But let me just say that uh, this was also the first War Games I've ever seen where every entrant got their own... Their music played and they got yes. to run out as opposed to being around the cage. Well, that's because everybody's such a big star. They And they also, they had to be out there even longer because... Everybody had to have an entrance, including all of the plumbers people had to come from the goddamn parking lot through the arena, past the concession stand, down past the EMT station and across from the fucking beer cooler. And they just elongate everything and they won't fucking, nothing beats anybody. There were people thrown on it. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to spoil it. I just, I thought, again, the uh, Claudio and Twinkle Toes started out first. And I noted the teams aren't ringside, so you can't see the animosity building, and you can't see one team in one corner, one team in the other corner standing by their doors, thinking, okay, you know, we've got strategy here. You're going to go in next to counter this guy. It's just a goddamn showbiz shit show. And... Again, Claudio's a great worker, and he's been buried in this whole thing, and so there's something else they might could have done something with. The rings were dark because the cage was fucking up the lighting, so you had shadows everywhere. Again, everything that... Did you hear the fans chanting, use this ring? Because I guess the fans on the far side hadn't gotten any action all night. Well, yeah, see, that's another part of the problem, is that... <laughs> 
they had uh, it, primarily when you do these two ring things, but it's television. You can't put your goddamn hard camera on a fucking sliding trolley. So they have to use the one ring for all the other one ring matches because the hard camera would be off center. And then the people over there, they're looking through a complete empty ring to see the other. You see where I'm going with that. Anyway. Um, so number three is Pac, who comes in through the arena menacingly in no hurry to help. And I guess we should mention the teams are obviously the BBC and everybody affiliated with them against the EVPs with their bosom buddy and lifelong chum from Japan, Kota Ibushi, and, uh, that's the the pairings in this, but obviously they're staggering the entrances. Number four was Hangnail Page. Number five, here come the plumber. And to this point, they'd been having a fight in a cage. There was nothing particularly that offensive about anything. But of course, Moxley brings new meaning to the word offensive whenever he comes in. He comes in the cage and starts stabbing Paige and Twinkle Toes with a fork in the head and stomach and mouth. By the way, this is the day after that Abdullah the Butcher Dark Side of the Ring aired. Yeah. And this is the week after Tony's memo about things that puncture you. And also, none of them bled at that point. He stabbed a bunch of people in the head. They didn't bleed forever after that. Then he brought in a bucket of what was purported to be broken glass and dumped it in the ring this early in the match. And people were taking bumps in it, and I'm sorry. But now, I've even though I know these people are fucking complete idiots, especially Moxley, and I'm sure he wanted to use real glass, that was phony fucking glass because they were rolling around in it. Yes, a few people had a couple scratches on their back. You can get those from Legos. But you couldn't roll around in real broken glass like that without slicing yourself severely. And it was there for fucking 30 minutes in the middle of the ring. And so that was his contribution to coming in hot. And then it was Nicky Buckaroo who drop kicked the plumber into his own broken glass. And then he took a bump in the glass. And I, at that point, I wrote, this is now everything wrong with modern wrestling. It's fake and dangerous at the same time. Silly and nonsensical while trying to simulate violence that nobody believes because it's so obviously preposterous. But guys are really getting hurt. And it devalues everything that guys with legitimate talent might do in front of these fans in terms of angles or finishes or whatever because nothing beats these fucking emaciated looking, minute, pudgy, out of shape or unknown fucking morons. You got a whole collection of them in there. Fits all of those descriptions. Can't kill them. Then here comes Wheeler Useless with a chair, and they went to the break before he even got to the ring. Wheeler Useless has to come through the arena because he's a member of the BBC. It seemed like there was a lot of stuff happening in picture-in-picture, picture, but it was so... I mean, it's picture-in-picture. Picture. There's only so much you could do to watch this. Well, and besides they're shooting two rings with a cage around it, there's fucking uh, close to 10 guys, about to be 10, and they're going to picture-in-picture picture while they're all just randomly fighting on and on. Again, as I said, there used to be some element of logic and psychology to these matches. During the entrances, the baby face shined when it was one on one or one against one, or the odds were even. When the heel had the man advantage, then they took over and got some heat so you could blow a comeback. And then once everybody got in there, then you could fight all around. This is just chaos from the word go. And so it, it gets so repetitive so quickly. And then when Matty Buckaroo came in and made his road warrior comeback, I noticed now the plumber was bleeding. And, you know, they, they didn't get blood from the screwdrivers and the broken glass, but then... 
people were bleeding randomly. Osmosis. And then Take a Shit comes in with a chair. So they can't even be original. Just every member of that team just comes in with a fucking chair. And then the plumber went underneath the ring and pulled out, I swear to God, they called it a bed of nails, but it was a bed of screwdrivers. It was huge metal-looking spikes or whatever. Obviously, again, not razor sharp or even sharp, hopefully dulled by a machinist, because people were taking body slams on them and not being punctured. I think Moxley eventually had bladed his back, but nobody else had took bumps on it, had multiple holes in them. But again, that's when Moxley body slammed Kenny onto it. He wasn't impaled or bleeding, but Moxley's there covered in blood from what he's done to himself, and he gets to live out his fantasy of being a circus sideshow geek without even bringing in the live chicken. And then you got a, they got a shot real briefly of Kenny trying to t- get up after a bump. He turned over and put his bare hand on the bed of nails trying to push himself up. But, and then Moxley was standing on it. And then finally, number 10, the number 10 man who got a big introduction while all this carnage is going on with supposedly nine main event guys in this company. They stop everything to give a lengthy ring introduction and video to this fucking, again, outlaw doll wrestler from Japan that's friends with Kenny, Kota Ibushi, another candidate, another fucking Muppet, as they say, over in the British Isles that people think is a, the world's greatest wrestling artist to these people. And here he comes, a doughy fucking nondescript fucking putz. You know, that is part of the story right there. It's interesting. He hasn't wrestled in a while. He's never wrestled for AEW. Again, this is not really his style of wrestling. But if you're into his doll wrestling or beyond that, things he's done, this kind of match isn't it. He showed up, and I've watched him before. Remember, he was in the Cruiserweight Classic. Before AEW started for I, NXT? I, I don't remember that, no. Well, he was in shape. He was always in really good shape. He was cut. He had abs. This is the guy who showed up here, and to say he wasn't impressive in the match or impressive looking would be an understatement. This is like a completely different Kota Ibushi. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm waiting to see this fucking meteorite flying across the sky, and I get a goddamn burnout fucking charcoal ember from a cookout besides his appearance which i don't care he didn't do anything he didn't do a goddamn thing except stupid shit he strolled out to the ring well wheeler useless left the cage with his team to meet this guy in the aisle to get knocked out with a punch yeah what was the point of that well to i'm sure kenny thought it'd be just great And then this dickhead strolls to the ring and just walks to the ring with no fire, no enthusiasm, no, I'm going to come in and kick ass, save the day, whatever. And he gets in and throws one punch each and just knocks out three of the heels. Is that his, is he the man with the hands of stone in fucking Japan? No. Well, a good thing, because then he and Moxley had their big stare down, you know, Japanese legend versus legend in his own deluded, warped brain. And right as Taz is talking about Coda's striking ability, he's on top of Moxley throwing punches that are so fake and so far away from the guy's head that the director had to cut away from it. The big fucking confrontation between these two And he gets on Moxley, and it's so bad looking, the director cut to nondescript guys fighting in the corner. And then everybody started fighting again. And two of these weasels were in the entrance way. It's a fucking cage match, and they're fighting in the... Hat on a hat. 
And then Moxley bumped on the bed of nails. And then Kenny, no, it was it was Coda. Coda and Kenny. Coda moonsaulted him on it, but it was a standing moonsault. You know, I don't know if this is another guy that could climb up to the top rope or not. Is he broken down too, or he just didn't give a fuck? I wouldn't be surprised if he's pretty broken down. He's been wrestling a Kota Ibushi type style for a long time. Well, good. Then it's the Kota Ibushi type. If this is Kota Ibushi style, I've seen him wrestle blow up dolls, six year old girls, and this. If this is his style, he needs to quit. He also threw a kick, hit, take a shit, and fell right on his own ass, got off balance. And again, they, they kept going to the break, and then they'd come back at one point. Maddie and Useless were on top of the cage, and they were doing Northern Lights suplexes to each other. I said, it's almost 40 minutes at this point. And then Matt, Matt Buckaroo, is up on the roof of the cage and takes a bag from somewhere and dumps thousands of thumbtacks into the cage so some of the other chicken biters can take a bump in them. And I wrote, did, God, this is the most self-indulgent bullshit. What the fuck? Go ahead. Did you hear, like, Scalibur plug blood donations? All these guys oh, were on yes. the fucking roof of the cage? Yes, during this, they were plugging in. But remember, donate blood to the Red Cross. I wouldn't donate blood now to the Red Cross just on the theory I wouldn't want any of these motherfuckers to have it if they needed it. To commemorate Shark Week, donate your blood. To commemorate this goddamn brain-damaged imbecile that we fucking indulge in his delusions, celebrate that, him cutting himself over and over on our television program in front of God and everybody, go give blood. So then Nikki slides a table into the ring. And I wrote again, hat on a hat. It's like Dr. Seuss wrote this match. And the fans started chanting, we want fire. So that's where they're at. That's wh that is how that this company has educated its wrestling fans. When they're seeing all this fucking shit already, they're chanting, we want fire. And they would be disappointed. Yes, they would. And then they did some uh, choreography. We had some Broadway in there. Four superplexes at the same time on different people, not right after another. Uh, by different people, on different people, and then a table break to conclusion. So four super superplexes and a table break has replaced two turntables and a microphone. There were a lot of moments in this match where someone would have someone in the corner that'd be up uh, on the second rope, you know, hitting him or whatever, but they would always pause and look behind them waiting for whatever they were expecting, whatever they were waiting for. So that happened several times. Well, because they've, they've set the whole thing up, obviously. And speaking of obvious setups, then they went for the 10-way phony punch fight where they think because there's 10 guys in the ring all allegedly punching each other that you won't look at any individual and see that it looks fucking fake. They're just swinging aimlessly. They're creating meaningless motion. And then everybody hit everybody. And then they got four simultaneous submission holes and a big swing. And I wrote that Coda looks like some guy from the college swim team that wandered in. Uh, he's wearing the fucking swim trunks and just, uh, what the, f what? <laughs> Again, I wrote, where's the greatness? So then Claudio and Pac got in an argument because Claudio hit Pac by mistake when he was charging in the corner and the other guy moved. So, Pac, explain this to me. He went and got bolt cutters and walked out of the, and cut the lock on the cage door and walked out of the match and slammed the door on Claudio's head. If they needed bolt cutters to get out, how were the two guys fighting in the entranceway and how were the two other guys on the roof a minute ago? That's a great question. They just, because uh, the bolt cutter spot will be cool. You got to use bolt cutters. Okay. But meanwhile, the other guys didn't want to give up their spots that they thought were cool. So they just did them anyway. And then, you know what happened? They had already been going almost an hour. And as Pac walked out, 
it was the end of the show and my DVR froze because the show was scheduled to be over. And they gave this fiasco an hour and it still wasn't enough for them. So what happened after that? Because all besides Pac walking out, did Take a Shit not walk out on him also from what I read? Yeah, Don Callis pulled Take a Shit, uh, Takeshita out of the match to, uh, he saw it was a losing thing so he pulled this guy from the losing team moxley submitted but it wasn't anything happening to moxley moxley submitted on behalf of wheeler yuda who was being choked out oh to save him to save him because moxley is so beneficent and benevolent hey give me credit if there's anyone you want to say he's been that way too it's wheeler yuda <sighs> yeah to put him on a fucking television so, so you ended then, the match with the five baby faces in the ring and three heels. Yes. Yes, they did. And apparently after all this was over with, it was the topic of Twitter in addition to lighting everything up because people going, what the fuck is this clown show bullshit that they showed on the air? Then... Whenever they went off the air, apparently both teams stayed in the ring to shake hands with each other after they'd been stabbing each other in the heads with screwdrivers and fucking throwing each other onto beds of nails. Good sportsmanship. They shook hands with each other. Sportsmanship. And then to put a period on the, or maybe even an exclamation point on the evening, Oh, Kota Ibushi, for no reason, no purpose whatsoever, just took his own flat back bump into the thumbtacks and then jumped up not selling it and rah rah everybody. And the clip of that go is going around and there were even people you hear in the building going, why, Kota, why? And what is he doing? He's an idiot. He killed the thumbtack bump. That, <laughs> God damn it. Like you, the thing that you shouldn't be doing anyway, but if you're going to do it, you ought to act like it hurts. And he killed the thumbtack bump. Because they're all fucking mental cases and they don't give a shit. And they think their shit don't stink. And there were people defending. Well, it was off the air. It was in front of 12,000 fucking people in Boston. Everyone with a camera in their pocket. Yes. Oh, but it wasn't on the TV show. They just did that off the air for fun. Yeah, fuck you and your fun. As a matter of fact, that should be a quote that goes around from me and a meme. Fuck you and your fun. Jesus Christ. So this was an hour of television of a bunch of reform school students and maladjusted misfits jacking themselves off under pretense of being in the wrestling business, doing every outlaw indie mud show wrestling cliche they could over and over until it was over with, with the added component of Moxley continuing to mutilate himself for no good reason and no fucking financial returns on the show because he does it all the time and it means nothing except to him and he enjoys it. So he does it. And the boss can't tell him not to because the boss has no balls. Your thoughts? I thought it was awful. I thought it was just completely terrible and not for me. I don't think this feud has worked. Again, it was a hot crowd, so they were into it. They were in the Dakota Ibushi, and he came out, and he looked terrible in my eyes. Didn't impress anyone. Couldn't have impressed anyone. Why would you even debut him in this kind of match? I guess in their heads, it justifies everything they've done that they've ended. Literally, the Coda, I guess, would be this <laughs> match. But I thought this was terrible. What, uh, what star rating do you think it got from The Observer? Oh, come on. I mean, what, what star rating would it get from anybody... With eyes, or what did it get from Dave? It had to get five stars from Dave. Four and three quarter stars, but according to Dave, that's just as good as five stars. Just as good. What do you well, think? Maybe. What do you think? FTR, Bullet Club Gold, two out of three falls, got in the Observer. The best tag team match of at least modern time. Yes. Four and a half. Five and a quarter. Ooh, so he's trying to allay some of the criticism. Good for Uncle Dave. 
Again, why would I don't know? It's it's just so stupid that five star is in the end. That now it's just all of a sudden a quarter. It's a quarter better than yeah. But 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 see now, but he can say, but look, I gave somebody else besides my best friends five stars. I even gave them five and a quarter. That's even better than five, except it's the same thing. Well, a very sad display on AEW Dynamite, and uh, we'll talk about the ratings in a moment. But before we get there, Jim, let's go to this commercial timeout. New from Slaughter Records, Corny Croons the Classics Acapella. Acapella, acapella. This collection features all your favorites from world-famous crooner and wrestling personality Jim Cornette. You'll get classics like... David Bowie! ch 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 changes The Drifters! This magic moment! Billy Paul! Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Jones! Mrs. Jones! Mrs. Jones! Mrs. Jones! Aaron Neville! Everybody no. plays the fool sometimes. There's <laughs> no exception to the rule. Listen, baby! <laughs> Ricky Nelson! He's a traveling man. Made a lot of stops. Randy Meisner! The moon was glowing bright, <laughs> and the stars were standing still, waiting for my baby in the cold December chill. And friends of distinction! Crescent and the and thick ass, baby, can you dig it? I can dig it, 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 dig it. Included in this collection is Corny Croon's Children's Classics. You'll get classic Warner Brothers cartoons. I love to sing about the moon and the June and the spring. Disney themes. And even local children's programming. Brush your teeth each morning. Get lots of sleep at night. Mind your mom and daddy, because they know what is right. Like classic TV themes? Well, Corny covers those too. There's Underdog, 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 and Car 54, where are you? Also, as long as they all relax in town before they resume with a bang and a boom, F Troop. As well as... Good times, even time you need a fan. <laughs> but wait, there's... We, it's about time, it's about space, it's about two men in a strangest place. And who could forget... Green Acres is the place to be. Farm living is the life for me. If you order now, we will also include Corny's Country Classics. With traditional standards like... Then you go round the bend when you come back again. There's some good old Mountain Dew. How about this barn burner? Oh, my darling, <laughs> oh, my darling, oh, my darling, Clementine. <laughs> and if you call within the next 24 hours, you'll get a special bonus recording behind the scenes of Jim Cornette warming up. Oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, oh. Oh, eh, oh, 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 er, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh, er, oh, le, oh, le, oh, le, oh, le, er, oh, e, 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 e. <laughs> Call Slaughter Records toll free at 1 800 555 corn. That's 1 800 555 corn to order Corny Croons the Classics a cappella. A cappella, a cappella. Four LPs only $9.99. Three eight-track tapes, only eight ninety-nine. Sorry, no CODs. That's Corny Croons the Classics a cappella. <laughs> All right, we are back. We hope you enjoyed the commercial break. Thank you, Rocky the Ramon, for sending that in. I had to mute myself because I, I'm sure the listeners wish I had muted myself before the recording of those various. Rimditions, but uh, thank you, Rocky. Whose show is this? Well, this just what, killed the show. What is going on here? This is this still the experience? Yes. All right. Well, still. Then we're gonna, still, it <laughs> apparently always will be. So we still have to talk before we move on to the world of the bloodline. We have to talk about the ratings at the fiasco that AEW presented last Wednesday night for Blood and Guts scored uh, okay they had they had every goddamn major alleged star that they have dedicated the wednesday night television program to for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks the the bbc the buckaroos and their pals the blood and gut the two ring guaranteed carnage chaos and vivisection match and 
one would think that they would have done the largest rating that they have done in recent weeks or months for something like that. One would suppose it's been built up and promoted. And also, one would think that this week they would have broken their usual tradition of hemorrhaging viewers as the show goes on because the big blood and guts match where they gave all the blood and guts was on last and people should have hung around to see that theoretically now i do not know because of the thing that i believe i mentioned earlier in this program before we did a little time traveling and i haven't had much sleep over the last few days i've been working on a fucking project so you are going to enlighten me now brian last as to what the ratings were for this Wednesday past Wednesday night without me ever having any predetermined knowledge of this important bullshit that we're about to talk about well this important bullshit was AEW Dynamite Blood and Guts July 19th the email from WrestleNomics is Blood and Guys I think he has a misprint here <laughs> Blood and Guts July 19th TBS was watched on average by 953,000 viewers. 953,000. So they did. They hopped themselves up on their blood and their guts, their plasma and their uterine samples. 100,000 people more than normal. Well, the show opened quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. Jack Perry's tryout for Breaking Bad, followed by Hook versus Jack Perry with Picture in Picture. 952,000 viewers. Aha! So this indicates that they are going to keep and indeed possibly gain some of these people. Well, quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Hook vs. Perry, the Adam Cole MJF buddy video, an ad break, Don Callis and Chris Jericho captured in a restaurant by Alex Marvez, and Kayla Sparks versus Britt Baker, 915,000 viewers. Okay, so they lost 37,000 on that because that was a great variety of not very gripping television. Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., Adam Cole, MJF, and Roderick Strong's backstage angle and the beginning of Adam Cole and MJF versus Daniel Garcia and Sammy Guevara with picture-in-picture 977,000 viewers. Woo! So, hand it off to MJF and Mr. Cole for their continuing saga, and they get 62,000 back. Not even back, but their 37,000 they lost and another uh, 25,000. The next quarter, quarter 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m., the continuation of Cole and MJF versus Garcia and Guevara with the post-match with Chris Jericho and Garcia and Guevara, uh, FTR, just as FTR, I don't remember what it was, did it do a promo or what, whatever it was, FTR, and an ad break, 967,000 viewers, and also the high point during the scheduled two hours for the key demo, 464. Hmm, so they lost 10,000. At that point, that's bathroom breakage material, if that. But again, like we've said, the Cole MJF stuff, I'm not really happy about it. However, the fans are reacting to it, and more than importantly, it's popping the youth number in terms of their viewers. But let's well, get to it's, it, it's MJF performing anything. At this point, I think he could, you know, fart in their general direction and pick up viewers. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., the Best Friends Orange Cassidy, Chris Statlander, Darby Allen, Nick Wayne backstage angle. The Blackpool Combat Club. I think Cl I managed to fast forward all the way through that. The Blackpool Combat Club Golden Elite video, entrances, an ad break, and the beginning of Blood and Guts, the Blackpool Combat Club with Takeshita and Pack versus the Golden Elite, 957. Thousand viewers. Jesus Christ, they lost 10,000 at the top of the hour for the start of the fucking end of the world? All right, that's surprising. Quarter I mean, that's, that's still, I just called 10,000 people uh, bathroom breakage, but that's fluctuation in what was already going on. This is the start of 
All right, never, nevertheless. Well, quarter six, the continuation of the Blood and Guts match with Picture in Picture twice. This is the high point of the two-hour scheduled show, 980,000 viewers. Okay, so they picked up another 23,000 there. Quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. Once again, the continuation of Blood and Guts with Picture in Picture 945,000 viewers. Jesus Christ! Okay, maybe they're proving our point. And finally, and there's going to be an overrun here, I tell you too, quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the conclusion of Blood and Guts with Picture in Picture, 928,000 viewers, (laughs) and the overrun from 10 to 10.03 p.m., 980,000 viewers. Ed, but how long was the overrun? Three minutes. Okay, so no. You don't get <laughs> you don't get the credit for three of the three minutes of the 15 minutes. It's only if it goes past seven and a half, right? Do you really get the credit for They're doing this a lot lately though with overruns with AEW trying to I don't know if they're doing it to try to increase the number or whatever the reason is. It's an artificial inflation if that's if they're averaging 953 and factoring that in. Cause no, suddenly on a declining on a declining ratings pattern over 45 minutes from quarter six, seven, or uh, yes, quarter six, seven, and eight. Yeah. That you don't suddenly get credit for a three-minute overrun that people are tuning into the scheduled program that suddenly boosts you 52,000 for three minutes. No. Especially since every other top of the quarter they had been fucking tuning out since that thing started. That's, they kept the majority of their audience on this program. If you look at the top of of the show to the bottom of the show, but if you take the blood and guts one hour and look at it by itself they still over the course of that match with those people lost viewers <laughs> they and from their high point to the finish of the main event of the most important match in the history of blah 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 they lost 52,000 people still not the major percentage that they normally do Uh, to be quite fair, and they managed to not even lose 5% or so from the start to the finish of the thing, and they got an extra 100,000 people from what they do every week. So kudos to them. But the nearly the high point came, the high point in the first hour came when MJF and Adam Cole got together, and the high point in the second half came and pretty much the first goddamn 15 minutes of that cage fiasco. And as the longer it went, the more people tuned out. What does that say to you? Considering the amount of TV time that's been spent on the elite versus Blackpool combat club feud that Cole and MJF, who are at this point doing comedy and just doing the the other, the other guys are falling in broken glass and thumbtacks and slicing their heads with razor blades and they can't get to fucking viewership of, a dance Goddamn contest. Olsen and Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> maybe they could. Maybe they could come out and do Mac and Moran. It would work. Um, it it shows that they promoted this this television show, this big event, this night of chaos and mayhem and comedy, and people tuned in for it, and they loved. MJF and Adam Cole, and they were kind of hanging around to wait to see the, you know, the the blood and guts thing. And as the blood and guts thing went on and on and on, people got less and less interested instead of more and more. Wasn't it? The, I mean, forgive me if I'm wrong, but last week, over the course of an hour on Saturday night, didn't FTR and Gin and Juice actually pick up people interested in what was going on when they heard about it? Yes, they did. Well, this was the opposite effect. Because as we all know from going to grade school, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. 
they put on a good match and people tuned in. They put on a stinky match and people said fuck it and started tuning out. Would you like to hear a preview of this Wednesday's AEW Dynamite from Albany, probably, New York? Probably not, but I have a feeling I'm going to anyway. Well, here's the lineup as currently announced as we are recording. For the AEW International Championship, Orange Cassidy versus <sighs> A.R. Fox. Oh, joy. We'll hear from MJF and Adam Cole. Also, <laughs> <laughs> that's all. You, just, just put up MJF. It just says we'll hear from them. Yeah, that's all you need. There'll be a big match with the man who defeated Commander at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view this past week. Pac will be going up against Gravity. <laughs> and if you didn't see the Ring of Honor pay-per-view results, Commander lost to Gravity. Wait. There is a wrestler named Gravity who's defeating the ridiculous high flying. And wrestlers. then and then after Pac battles Gravity, he'll grapple with logic. Wait until he gets the jealousy. That's gonna be the feud I want. <laughs> Pac versus jealousy. <laughs> also on the show, I've never seen Gravity, so I can't say anything too much about him. I've never seen it either, but I hear it works on apples. Sean Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli. Oh, versus boy. the Lucha Brothers versus Best Friends. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's, it's going to be like if the Bowery Boys all went to wrestling school at the same time. And not even Leo Gorsi and Hunts Hall, but the other ones with Billy Hallop. But anyway, Darby <laughs> Allen versus Swerve Strickland. And finally, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, versus Taya Valkyrie. Well, there you go, boy. It probably won't take us long next week to talk about collision, folk, or talk about dynamite, rather. All things, I was going to say all things considered, but taking everything into the equation. <laughs> I'd rather not consider all these things. Considering they're coming off this big blood and guts match, surprising that we're not having more stuff on this show announced in advance concerning the people actually involved in a match other than Claudio and Moxley being in a random three-way tag match? I don't know, because I zip through all the goddamn announcements anyway. Because it's just meaningless, multiple names being shouted out as quickly as possible with all these stipulations and convoluted things that only people that need medication in order to control themselves can possibly keep track of. Well, that's AEW Dynamite coming this Wednesday from Albany, New York. Tickets start at $10 million. <laughs> right now, wherever you find your favorite tickets. And you know what? You know what, Brian? I've mentioned to you. I've mentioned to you how that I've deprived myself of sleep over the last few days, this little outside project I've had going on. And that's a bad thing to do. It's a bad thing to deprive yourself of sleep. And that's why we talk about our fine friends and advertisers and sponsors, including the people from Helix Sleep. That's right. That help everybody get a better night's sleep, for heaven's sake. As a matter of fact, you know this. I believe I told you this off the air. Felt your feather bottom. You know, he's had a problem sleeping. You know, you know, I've told the, the listeners, maybe some of the lewd, new list, lewd, lewd some listeners. Some of the lewd listeners. Listen in the lewd. Some of the new <laughs> listeners might not know about the feather bottom family. They know about Hotchkiss because he mails, you know, all of the, the merchandise and he runs the website. He's the guy that invented the screenshot and the email blast and things like that. Well, his aunt and uncle, Aunt Fanny and Uncle Felcher, they help in the, in the in enterprise also. They're boxing things. They're packing stuff up. But Felcher Featherbottom has had problems sleeping for some time. I'll have you know, Brian, that every morning that he wakes up, the first thing that happens when he opens his eyes is he has, he regurgitates vomit all over the place. And it, it, the doctors have changed. It doesn't happen any other time of day. It doesn't happen, at, you know, at any other point except he first wakes up and he opens his eyes and, <clears throat> and boy, even though they try what? to clean, it starts smelling. What are you so, talking about? Well, I'm telling you, he's got that problem with vomit regurgitation all over the place first thing in the morning. So what he does yeah. is he goes to the doctor to check him out, and they say, we can't find anything wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you physically. It must be something the way you're sleeping because it only happens first thing when you wake up and you open your eyes. So he takes us for 
obviously for the gospel, everything that we say is true. And he heard one of our Helix Sleep ads, and I'll have you know that he went to helixsleep.com, and he looked through the incredible variety of mattresses they have. For example, we've talked about the Elite Collection that have six different mattress models, each one of them tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. If you like it hard, they'll give it to you. And if you like it soft, you can waller around in it. And every Helix Elite mattress comes with a 15-year manufacturer warranty. They've got, they've all, all the mattresses have the 100-night free trial, so you can bring it into your home, do pretty much bloody anything you want to on it. You can sleep on it. And if you don't like it, then you can send it back. But you're going to like it. Your money back. But well, nobody does that, because how rude would you be? You get the finest mattress that God has ever put on his green earth, and then you, just like a, an ungrateful pig, you would send it back. Nobody's that picky. These things are perfect. And they support the military at Helix and first responders, teachers, and students. They give them special discounts on the site. Well, by the time you get past military, first responders, teachers, students, geez, that's almost everybody. Because almost everybody's teaching somebody something, and the people that aren't, well, they're almost all learning something. Except for the Trumpers, they don't learn anything. But and a lo unlike a lot of the mattress companies, Helix manufactures its own. They've got their own team of skilled manufacturers. You ought to see these guys. There's about four of them. And they are, I'll tell you what, they work like nobody's business. They just, they turn these mattresses out. One of them sews and the other one holds the shit because you know they're big, right? This, none mattresses. of this is true. They have no, an entire they team. Have no, 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 it's not true. Manufacturers, and they then they ship them directly from their facility to your door. Yes, that's true. That's to two of them sew and hold, and two no, of them box and ship. You have no idea how they do their staffing, so let's stop pretending you do. Well, I don't know their names, and I'm not sure how much they're paid, but they're really good workers. Their workers it, are really good, but we do not have yes. the number. We do not have the head count. Well, I had their number as soon as they walked through the door. The Helix has mattresses with cooling technology that help regulate your body temperature if you're sleeping hot, whatever. And you don't have to go to a store and lay down on some of those mattresses. But getting back to Felcher, Felcher and Fanny Featherbottom, Felcher was having that problem. And he went to the doctor and said it must be something to do with your sleep patterns. So what he did was he got a Helix sleep mattress. He went to helixsleep.com and he took the quiz where he told him whether he liked soft, medium, firm, and whether he slept on his side or back or stomach, and, and all of those specifications. He didn't mention about the vomit regurgitation first thing in the morning because they didn't have a box on the site for that. Helix, you might want to fix that soon and, and have no. a question, do you vomit immediately upon awakening? No, it doesn't seem like it's a widespread problem. It seems like it's confined to the Felcher feather bottoms <laughs> you, you or whatever. You think it might be more of a a smaller niche problem now hopefully well see it it's already been cured helix cured felcher because what he did was when he got that new helix sleep mattress he put it right in and he laid right down and the next day he woke up and he was perfect he didn't regurgitate the vomit he was he was feeling good all day and fanny and fanny likes hers too as a matter of fact he got them at the same time and he put his in his bedroom and he put hers out in the hallway and she slept on that. And now every day since he did that, he wakes up in that bed and opens his eyes and he doesn't vomit anymore. And then he calls out to Fanny in the hallway. Wake up, Fanny! In the hallway? Yeah, that's where she's sleeping. And ever since that that's happened, he wakes up and opens his eyes and he doesn't vomit first thing in the morning. It's well, got to be due to the Helix well, sleep listen, mattress. There's no guarantees that Helix will help you with some sort of bizarre medical problem you've never heard of before. However, we can guarantee they will be a fine mattress that you will enjoy. And of course, if you don't like it, you can send your money back. We have two mattresses and an all-form couch from Helix here in the house, here at Last Manor, and we love them. And uh, we'll probably get some more. Check them out today. And remember, they support us. You should support them. Yes, and, and, and see, that's a pun, because not only do they support our program, and they support our efforts to bring this program to the cult of Cornette, but also they support us literally when we're laying on them. That's right. Very good. Very well yeah, done. Yeah, so see, you're a punster. Well, thank you. Or, 
As Mama Cornette used to say, you're a poet and don't know it, but your feet show it because they're long fellas. Anyway, so right now, folks, what you need to do to support everybody. Good Lord, it's the burden is on you now, Cult of Cornette listeners. You've got to support everybody in this equation. You got to go to helixsleep.com slash JCE because right now they're offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. 20% off the mattress and a couple of free pillows that you can lay your weary head down or potentially you can take it out in the hall and smother Fanny with it. Go to helixsleep.com slash JCE right now. It's their best offer yet and it won't last long. So jump on it right now. I don't mean jump on the mattress, jump on the offer. Well, hell, jump on the mattress. Just make sure that it isn't one that somebody's on, like Felix or Fanny. You will have your own mattress in your own house. You don't have to worry about random people from the cult of corn or from the factory of cornet being on your mattress. Well, no, you know, there, there's nobody on these mattresses. But Except somebody's you. somebody's in your walls <laughs> anyway. Oh my god. Right now, helixsleep.com slash JCE. If it's good enough for the feather bottoms, it's good enough for your bottom. Helix sleep mattresses. That's right. Hey Jim, some uh, funny a funny update here. A funny update? A funny update. It appears some of the Cult of Cornet members have found a video on YouTube entitled Colin Thompson on how to make money with your podcast. Oh! <laughs> of all the titles for a video oh! by this guy. <laughs> how to make money with podcasts. Take no, someone else's no. money and run. I was about to say, the <laughs> video should be titled How to Make Money with Somebody Else's Podcast. <laughs> do, we have any, do we have any video or any audio from that? Uh, hold on. Give me a chance. I'll pull it up. Hold on. How does that start? How does he commence that sales pitch to people? Send me a check and I'll I'll make money with your podcast. That's about the only way he'd know how to do it. All right, it's taking a second to load here. I wasn't prepared for this. Hold on. Well, you you need to be prepared for my load every time, just every second of the day. Well, I'm not behind the dumpster right now, sir, but hold on. Here we go. Let's hear some audio. If you have an audience of 10,000 and 100 pay $8 a month, you're making $800 a month off of that. And that's probably a lot more than you would be generating off of affiliates, maybe even merch. Well, there's a, a teaser <laughs> of some of the wit and wisdom. If, if there are 17,000 people in Wartburg, Tennessee, and each one of them was to give you 50 cents lunch money every day, you'd make $74,000 a week. But the problem is they ain't going to do that. And I don't know how to make them because I'm Colin Thompson and I owe everybody money and I file <laughs> bankruptcy after collecting other people's money instead of giving it to them. That's what they should be saying over there. Maybe you're being a bit harsh. Maybe there's a, oh, here are the topics. The topics include monetization, advertising revenue, joining a network, podcasting as a medium. Who is the podcast listener? Who is the podcast audience? <laughs> How Colin got interested in podcasts. Who is the jailer with the keys to my cell? Pitching your podcast. Are they hedging their bets? That's an interesting topic there. Mm. Who are the listeners? Uh, how much money can a podcast make? Monetizing an audience. Advertising. No gatekeepers. Deal structure. And how to get paid. Maybe we should watch that part. Let's see how to get paid. It varies from case to case. It's why, you know, <laughs> we and other people have a full sales team because there's so many different equations to deal with. Sometimes it's a relationship with an agency that specializes in a specific kind of deal with their brands where the brand goes to them saying, hey, we, we are willing to pay $5 per, you know, sign up. and the and then I keep that money and I, <laughs> and I go to Acapulco. <laughs> oh man, this idiot. Well, more to come from this. We'll go through various things and uh, play some audio examples in the future so you can hear the likes of what we're dealing with. But uh, this is your show. All righty then. Well, let's talk about their show, Smackdown from July 21st. It was a Friday night on FS1. 
FS1 not on SmackDown because of the uh, the World Cup, the, the the soccer or football, whichever part of the world you're in, the terminology applies. That was on Fox on Friday night, so SmackDown got bopped over to FS1. And remember in in the past when they go to FS1, which is not as big as Fox Network Television, it's a subsidiary group. They're down in the hundreds of thousands of viewers for SmackDown normally, right? Well, I'm going to... Uh, spoil, spoiler alert. I'm going to spoil this on FS1, on the tease of the bloodline and the what the rules of engagement or terms of endearment, whatever they, however they had advertised that. They did 1.2 million viewers on FS1 almost overnight. 1.18, whatever the fuck it was. I didn't see the quarters on this thing. I just accidentally saw it on Twitter right before we got on the, the horn here with each other, Brian. But <laughs> my God, what kind of drubbing does that have to be? To, they did blood and guts, as we mentioned. They sliced themselves with real razor blades and phony glass to do 950,000 people on the, in their regular time slot on their regular network, and the bloodline's so hot on SmackDown, they do 1.2 million people on FS1 just to see what they're going to fucking talk about about the match that they're going to have later sometime, somewhere. If and you, uh, they, they said they said it was thirty five percent more. I said they were down like eight hundred and something thousand last time on FS one. Now one point two million. Go ahead. What were you going to say? If you only had limited dates with Roman Reigns, do you use one of his dates on FS one? Well, yes, because it, it's the timing of the revelation of all these things. It's not like they're doing this week to week. I mean, if, I'm sure Tony is in a lot uh, large part. Some of the other geniuses over there may be plotting their stuff out, but with the bloodline thing and Heyman being involved in this, they've got a great and you you can tell they've got a great outline of where they're going. When you I don't know how they creatively write things from writing school and educated writers and all that stuff, how they do it in the TV world and everything. But when you were booking wrestling, you had your goddamn calendar out. You said, I got to reveal this on this date or shoot this angle on this date so that I can VTR it the next week and have the promoter sanction the match and have the interview with the fucking guy that leads to the thing. So before it, you work out from your date of your big show to how things move along from week to week, to get you there. And so they probably needed to do this. And as we'll talk about the ending segment, reveal whatever the fuck it was they revealed. Maybe it was just to give us some goddamn Columbo bullshit to think about because there were, there were certainly not a lot of declarative statements made in that anyway. So they probably had to do it, but still they're going to, they're going to VTR it on raw. That's going to have its normal audience. And they're going to be able to then, come back next week and continue on SmackDown with a recap on video of what happened here. So, and they, they lost a million viewers from the, what they've been doing with SmackDown lately, but it's not like that this was just suddenly, you know, preempted for fucking mighty mouse reruns. They still had over a million people watching it. Anyway, however, boy, howdy. What did you think of not even the the quality of the match of the opening match, but what did you think about just the the logic, the psychology, the why of this has to be this way? Why does it have to be this way? Are you for <laughs> what? I was gonna say, are you speaking specifically about LA Knight losing? Well, not only that, but just the whole it it was a four way match where the winner would advance to next week to face. Escobar, who won a four-way last week, and the winner of that will face Austin Theory for the U.S. title, but they had Mysterio and Seamus and Cameron Grimes and L.A. Knight. Not just that L.A. Knight didn't win this, but four babyfaces in the match, uh, technically 
three baby faces against L.A. Knight, who is kind of a heel, but actually that's why he's a baby face, and he's the most popular one of all of them. And why did it have to be these people where there was nobody to actually root against in this whole thing, so they made the, the people decided we're just going to, we're not going to boo Seamus mostly, and we love Ray, but in this equation, we're just going to cheer for every time L.A. Knight takes a fucking breath, and if anybody touches him in a rude manner, we're going to fucking mostly boo him. And, and then he doesn't even win it. I, I, it was very odd to me, and it went for a while. You're, th well, so that's what I said. What, did this make sense to just do this on purpose? It did not make sense. I don't think they should be beating L.A. Knight in any way. I'm not a fan of the four-way matches. I mean, I can't say too much more than I haven't said already about how counterproductive I think these things are. But the matches themselves don't mean much on these shows. The L.A. Knight promos mean as much as him losing, I guess, in their eyes. But he shouldn't be losing. He's the biggest merch seller they have right now, at least with T-shirts. So it doesn't make any sense to me. And when you look at the people in this match... Ray and Sheamus have been there forever. There's a ceiling, a time-related uh, ceiling more than anything else, too. Grimes has a future. L.A. Knight is super over right now. The four-way here doesn't make much sense to me. Well, where they're going, and we'll find out in a minute. To recap the match, L.A. Knight comes out last, does a promo in the hallway, gets a huge reaction. The people chant for him. He wants to take the U.S. title at SummerSlam. And from then on, every time he touched somebody, they came apart, the fans. And if anybody did anything offensive to him, even though it was three other baby faces, they didn't like it. And it was the standard nonsensical four-way, especially the WWE has, where a couple of guys disappear for a long stretch so the other guys can do their shit. And the fans even shit on Seamus when he tried to get their support to give him the big kick to give la knight the big kick ray had it won theory pulled him off the cover and ran him into the stairs but of course it's no disqualification lazy booking so that nothing happened there but here came escobar and he came out and jumped on theory and they fought off into the crowd and la knight hits his elbow on grimes to a roar from the audience and then Seamus kicks L.A. Knight, and Gr Grimes cave-ins Seamus, and then Rey Mysterio rolls Grimes up one, two, three. Because now next week, it's going to be Rey Mysterio against his protege, Pablo Escobar, to determine who gets the U.S. title match, and I predict that Pablo will win, and he will not win by switching heel on Rey Mysterio, he will beat him fair and square, and Rey Mysterio will hold his hand up to the adoring throng because obviously they feel that pushing Escobar as the new Hispanic babyface hero, whether or not the people are going to take to that remains to be seen. But they got L.A. Knight in front of them right now. It's tearing the house down, but it's more important because they've decided that, and pro I'm pretty sure it's Vince, has decided that Escobar is going to be the new Hispanic hero, and that's what they're doing. At L.A. Knight's expense, unfortunately, in this equation. And they were half an hour into the program at this point. There are reports going around, again, you don't know where these things come from, that Vince is high on L.A. Knight and he's trying to figure out what to do with him. What do you think? Trying about to figure out what to do with him. Just have him win his fucking matches. Uh, uh. Yeah. What were you going to say? That was really it. I guess. I, okay. Yeah. That summed it up. There you go. And then theory in the back asks Adam Pierce for a match against Escobar, not for the title, just one-on-one -on -one because he came out and got in his business. And they, they did a Cody and Brock package of what happened on Raw. And then Charlotte versus EO Sky. And they went two minutes to the break. And they came back and went a while. 
And Charlotte won, and Oscar jumped Charlotte and beat her up and got an arm bar on her. Were there, were there any subtleties I missed over that period of time? No. All righty. So Dominic Mysterio, meanwhile, is the new NXT North American heavyweight champion because they went to NXT, did the Judgment Day last week, and he beat old Dan Tucker, whoever had this fucking belt beforehand, and they did another huge number, like 800 and something thousand people, as I recall hearing, for NXT because now they're cross-pollinating with the, you know, the the main roster names and there were dominic and Rhea were in the back crowing over being the north american which by the way being the north american champion is better than if ray wins the u.s title because that's only the united states but north america has like 30 countries or whatever the fuck i don't know what they were saying but north america is bigger than the united states aren't there more countries in south america than there are in north america of course well, then he, he should be the South American champion, shouldn't he? No, because there's no wrestling down there. That's not what he's doing. He's well, wrestling in like North it America. Would be, it seems like it would be an easier fucking title to pick up. How? There's no wrestling there. Well, no, I'm saying he's That's not wrestling there. He's not wrestling there. Oh, well, you said there was no wrestling. I don't know whether they're wrestling down in Ecuador these days. I mean, naming him the South American champion would be like naming someone the All-Atlantic champion or something. Well, that would just be ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah. To have Japanese flags and Chinese flags on the belt for the All-Atlantic champion. Well, you wouldn't even know what ocean you were in. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Apparently, as for people who are just in deep water over their heads. Anyway. Hopefully so you have a navigator. <laughs> I used to have a navigator. Really? It was a Lincoln Navigator. Yeah, but it got brain damage. That's when I, I turned it in and got the Ford Expedition. And it was much more dependable. Sorry for your so, loss. We were back in Roman's locker room, and this was brilliant. Now they've decided, since the bloodline and everybody in it is so far ahead of everybody else in terms of their acting skills, we're going to do a silent segment where we just emote with our faces. <laughs> Just tie half of our brain around our back to make it even. There's Roman with his tribal chief lay in his hands, and he's looking at it. And then he looks to the left, and he sees Solo looking at it. And in the back of him is Paul, who was sitting there first. He was like all pontificating to himself like he's the wise man. But then he sees Roman, sees Solo see the lay and roman then his expression changes as he looks at solo like can i trust him and then paul starts getting nervous then you can tell that he's shaken like a dog about to shit peach seeds when solo sees that roman because solo's looking at the lay but then solo looks up from the lay to look at roman and sees roman looking at him and he was looking back to see if you were looking back to see if he was looking back to see if you were looking back at me. He was happy as could be sitting under Stop. that. Stop. So, so Solo saw Roman <laughs> looking at him, and then he looked down. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, it was it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And, and now there's there's all kinds of options for betrayal and vengeance and pontificating. So anyway, then we had Theory versus Escobar. And they went three minutes to the break. And when they came back, Theory was in control and he... <laughs> Escobar immediately came back and hit a dive and they went into their false finishes. And that's why I know even with good talent and Escobar ain't doing too bad. And we love, we love our boy theory, but even with good talent, all the WWE matches look alike. Don't they? It's just the same. Very few Gunther and a few other people can do some different shit there, but, Anyway, old Escobar hit a hurricane run off the top rope, and uh, Theory took a big-ass bump, and then he hit his finish one, two, three. So, I've, again, Escobar beats the U.S. champion in a non-title match, 
or what do they call the non-title match? A a negative championship opportunity, or what the fuck do they have the uh, the phraseology they have? Say it again. They don't negative they don't, championship opportunity. The negative champion. Well, they don't like to say non-title match. Oh, so um, when the title is not up, what do they say? In AEW, it's an eliminator match. But I've, over here, they don't like to say that either. Over here, they say it's a commercial break. Okay. Well, anyway, so that's where again, I think that's what's going to happen next week. Escobar will beat Ray, but not in a heelish way. But they're trying to pass a torch here. Well. <laughs> L.A. Knight's red hot and on fire, and they're trying to pass a torch over to Pablo. All righty. Then it was time for the NXT North American title to be on the line. Dominic against Butch. The Do you think Butch is jealous because he was the little urchin gimmick until Dominic came along and was a better Weasley chicken shit urchin? I don't think he could be jealous. Dominic's a completely different thing. Maybe he's jealous that Dominic has Rhea. That, that's something worth being jealous that, over. Now that's worth being jealous about, but there can only be one urchin. One urchin in the group. And Butch has the, has the urgent to be the urchin, but it wasn't going to work. Anyway, they went a minute and a half, and Ridge Holland ran down to steal a chain away from Dominic. And then they came back, and within... Out of minutes, whatever, here comes purely deadly to ringside. The blonde one's in a wheelchair because of his injured shoulder. Yes, I said that. And when that happened, I've just, I've, I fast forwarded to the finish, which happened about one minute later when purely deadly did comedy with Ridge and they all ran off and Ripley interfered and Dominic posted Butch and tried to cover him while tangled all up in the fucking ropes and finally Rhea screaming, Push him out! And he fucking rolled him over and pinned him one, two, three. Did I miss anything there? I don't think so. I get a kick out of Dom. I get a kick out of Dom, and I think Dom and Rhea are fantastic together. Well, of course. And was it you peeking in their window? How do you know how they are together? I'm talking about on screen, on camera, on TV. On chemistry, they got chemistry on camera. They they're, got they're... chemistry, and I've said it before, Rhea Ripley, when she's not in the ring, she's better working ringside than anyone else in wrestling right now. Because she knows what the fuck she's doing. It's just, uh, anyway. At that point, we had 13 minutes left on the air. And it was time for the segment that we've all been waiting for, the bloodline to get in the ring, and now it's the rules of engagement. And as you will recall last week, the Paul Heyman, I believe he was the one that said, you know how this goes, Jay. It was handed down by your father from his father, from his father, from his father before him. They've been handed down from generation to generation to generation, the traditions of the Canaanites and all that other stuff, right? Well, now they come out, and they got a big crowd in Orlando. They said 14,000 people. I would assume it was close. And, I mean, the, for Grayson Waller, they will set the fucking ring up like a dentist's office with fake potted ferns and all, the, all this tripe. But for the rules of engagement for the tribal chief against the, you know, budding tribal chief, they have a marble desk and two leather desk chairs. Did the Samoans have a marble desk and two leather desk chairs when they would sit down over the the campfire or the the uh, poo poo platter or the goddamn pig in the ground or whatever it was and do this after they blew the the big shells that went and brought all the tribes people and. It, what the fuck was going on here? It looked like a goddamn mediator's office at a fucking insurance firm. I'll just say this before you go further with your review. This was the first Bloodline segment in a while, especially featuring Roman, all the key players, that I thought was a miss. For me, Swing I didn't Swing like and it. a miss. Yeah. So, it, it, I, this would have been the place for, I know Afa and Sika are you know, somewhat older and may not be able to travel. All the, they, Rikishi? Some of the elders, some official-looking somebody. Fucking, you know, King Curtis's kid, anybody. 
but so they sit down, Roman and, and Jay, and Solo and Paul are standing, and Roman says, do you, you still want to do this? Hey, I, I got to get you. No, you won't get me because you don't get it. You're just a soldier. You're just a pawn. So Roman signs the contract and hands it over to Jay, and Jay pulls the contract up and tears it up. And the people think, well, is he, is he reconsidering? But then he says, I don't need no contract. The contract is in our blood. This is tribal combat now. And Roman's like, do the elders know? It was their idea. And somehow we find out that tribal combat is <laughs> anything goes, no disqualification. I swear to God, I'm not making this. They couldn't even fucking do, okay, we're going to be attached with a fucking leather thong left wrist to left wrist in our right hand. We've got a fucking tiki torch. Tribal combat is no DQ. And the examples that Jay starts giving are, I can hit you with a chair. Do they have chairs in the middle of the fighting pit set aside on the island for the elders? Da, da, da. I can take that lady's shoe off and hit you with it. Now he's doing comedy. Oh, is this going to be a match with a giant mouse trap? So then Roman tells everybody to shut up which was a good idea, probably the best thing that could have been said at that point. And he says he runs the business, so he puts the bell down and said, boom, stands up and says, let's go. And Jay says it's tribal combat, so Roman takes off the lay, his tribal chief lay, and puts it on the belt. And now, here's the, th at this point, I just said the, the backstage silent interview was good because that was a close-up with a camera where you were seeing people's expressions and it wasn't in a 14,000-seat arena. The people in the building were not picking up. Brian, do you agree on all these subtle Samoan traditions that they were referring to? And it sounded more like everybody was going, what the fuck is happening here? I, again, maybe it's because it was on FS1. They didn't give us something truly special maybe it's they thought this was something as part of the overall story to me again this just didn't do it i think it. they thought this was special this did not for me this didn't do it and i've said it before and they've gone around it like you know it could get stale quick if they don't do something if like someone doesn't make a move or do something this could get stale and they've always been on top of that minor things big things big crowd reactions this, you know, you keep saying a, a swing and a miss. This was a swing and a miss to me. Well, well, now, but wait a minute. The best part was coming up next because I just said the people weren't actually getting the Samoan traditions. I swear to God. At that point, Roman and Jay got face to face with each other. And then they did a soul brother type handshake. And then they leaned over and touched foreheads and looked at each other's eyes. I swear to God, I wrote, but they didn't hop on one foot first. <laughs> that was a, a legend. I guess that's the stance they get into before they have the tribal combat, when they shake hands and touch foreheads. And then Roman turns to leave. And suddenly Solo just says, well, fuck this. And he flips the desk over and grabs Jay and starts to spike him. And Roman hooks the spike and stops him. And while he does that, Jay slips out and super kicks Solo. And Roman stands there shocked and then steps out. And that was that. So I, I'm just thinking that maybe they should have passed out a... Um, a handbill when the people filed in here are the rules of tribal combat they will tear up the contract that they've just signed at the fancy signing table and then they will stand up shake hands touch foreheads jump down turn around pick a bale of cotton and burn a chicken's beak under a half moon and then the curse will be lifted. I don't know what the fuck was going on here. 
All righty. And again, I'm sick of guys in the ring who hate each other and they could just stand there and talk to each other or yell at each other. Like too much of that with the bloodline. It gets to the point where it's physical and then we go right back to everyone sitting in the room and staring at each other. It was a little disappointing, but you know what's not disappointing? You know what's exciting, Brian? You know what every time that this thing happens, that this event takes place, it fills your heart with joy and your house with awesomeness. You know what that is? What's that? That is every month when the package gets dropped off at your door and you see that it is your box of awesome from Bespoke Post. That's when you, that's the the culmination, the high point, the pinnacle, if you will, of your month because it is never a bait and switch. You don't think you're going to get a good bloodline and then you get a bad bloodline because the box of awesome every month it lives up to its billing because it's not a box of bleh. It's a box of awesome. And you go awesome. I have awesomeness now. Do you know what I just got in my box of awesome? What did you get? I got a complete mint julep set, silver julep cups, and the little beater stirrer thingy, and the goddamn straws that go with. You know, juleps are big, Brian, in Kentucky. The mint julep. But you can make any drink in the mint julep cup, and it looks like you're a millionaire because it's silver and has silver straws and is is just beautiful. It's awesome. And I know that you just got your do-it-yourself pizza kit. Yeah, they sent me a bunch of things so I could actually plant the basil myself. I could plant the cherry tomatoes myself. I could make all the ingredients myself. Suzanne actually gets Box of Awesome, too, from Bespoke Post, and she got a knife that's really awesome that I'm going to steal. And that way you'll be able to cut your pizza with it. Well, it's not, and a, then, it's not a pizza knife, but uh, it's just well, a knife. You, it's, it's a knife that would be sharp enough to cut a pizza, right? Right, but you don't want to well, just take a knife. When you've got and... a pizza that needs to be cut, you'll cut it with it. I've cut pizzas with goddamn all kinds of things. Box cutters. Box cutters. And, and fucking pieces of cardboard kind of what? shaved out. You know what? Well, sometimes you're in a hotel late at night. You got to improvise. They forgot to cut the fucking pizza. You got a box there. What I'd do is I'd tear off one of the fucking ends of the box and I'd kind of gnaw into that goddamn pizza with the cardboard if I didn't have anything else. Who forgets to cut the pizza when they send it out? <laughs> Apparently Domino's late at night in the 80s. But nevertheless, you, you'd be surprised what ingenuity can do for you when you're stuck in a hotel room and need implements. But you, if you get a box of awesome, they got boxes of awesome, as you mentioned, with knives in them, and and that way you'll always be able to cut your pizza. They got multiple boxes of awesome with knives, steel knives, and uh, knives by bare bones based in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I don't know what they make them out of, but they're nice. And you got the gut hook knife made by Titan International from Illinois because everything in the box of awesome comes from small and or medium-sized independent retailers and craftsmen and people that it's not big box store stuff. This is fine quality craftsmanship. You're supporting good, wholesome Americans that that put <laughs> seeds in the ground and water it and let the sun bring the things to the surface, and then you can make your pizza out of it. And the sausage-making machine that they sent what? you in, in your do-it-yourself pizza kit. They didn't the send me a sausage making machine. They didn't send me that, a sausage making machine. Well, how are you going to make the sausage for your pizza? I'm not going to have sausage on my pizza because I actually like pizza. I'm actually someone many, who likes pizza, not one of these phonies like from Kentucky who don't know anything about on. pizza and eat it with cardboard late at night because wherever he gets it from, they don't even cut the pizza. Well, how many pigs did they send you with your pizza kit? They sent me three. God damn, I. I hope this other stuff grows quick because these pigs are eating me out of house and home. I guess the point is, with the things they sent me, I can make a pizza with natural ingredients that'll be healthier and better than whatever crap you got in the hotel late at night in the 80s, and yeah. I'll have a very, very sharp blade to slice it however I wish. Yeah, see, give a man Domino's number and he can eat for a night, but give a man the stuff to grow a pizza from scratch and he can eat forever <laughs> until the pigs run out. <laughs> but folks, they've got all kinds of camping gear essentials, cooking, cookout must-haves, cooking implements, drinking game upgrades. They've got collections for every part of your life, and all you have to do is go to boxofawesome.com, 
That's where it starts. It all starts there. And take the quiz. And then your answers help them determine the right boxes of awesomeness for you, tailored to your preferences and likes. They, get, they release new boxes every month, ton of different categories. And each box is valued at around $70, but you pay a fraction of that price. You know what a fraction is, Brian. That's a much lesser ingredient in the overall total. Well, unless the fraction is close to five stars and then it rounds up. Well, no, we're not. If it's within a quarter of a fraction, we're not disagreeing. Plus, with each box of awesome, you're supporting those small businesses. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small up-and-coming brand that works out of a storefront in Poughkeepsie and only has a post office box. But they do good work. It's free to sign up with Box of Awesome, and you can skip a month or cancel any time right now. If you go to boxofawesome.com, you can get 20% off your first month's box if you enter the code JCE at checkout, boxofawesome.com. 20% off your first box with the code of JCE. And by the way, awesome is spelled A-W-E-S-O-M-E. We had a couple of people write in and say, well, I, I wrote awesome, A-W-S-O-M. Oh, come on. No one wrote I swear. That. Was it The Miz? It was The Miz. You, you, you caught it. But anyway, boxofawesome.com, code JCE, 20% off your first. If, if you only get into one box a month, this is the box you need to get into. That's right. Let's see who can grow a pizza faster, me or you. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, in that case, if they didn't send you the sausage maker, then to be fair, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and I'm just going to tell my pigs to stay, stay tuned and I'm going to drop the sausage maker and just let me know when they send you your pepperoni filler. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, if I ever was going to add an ingredient to my pizza, I think I'd go with pepperoni before sausage. Oh, come on. Hold on, Pepper you, pepperoni you think is the, pepperoni's the meat you get when you can't have sausage. Pepperoni's like number two after, I think it's like of a regular cheese slice or pepperoni. I would think that's the number two most popular selection in the world. Well, but you got to eat a lot of pepperoni to fucking weigh yourself down as heavy as you do when you eat a good fucking hunk of sausage. What do you think of chicken on pizza? I see a lot of places now have chicken parmesan pizza. Yes. Oh, well, now let me tell you something. I'm not for the barbecue chicken because I don't feel that barbecue and pizza should cross paths. I but agree. chicken, bacon, ranch, pizza with a white sauce or a ranch sauce is mm, like a, an Alfredo type of thing or a ranch sauce. Chicken and bacon, green peppers, mushrooms. Your tongue will slap your brains out. Well, I'll let you know how this goes. But once again, Box of Awesome from Bespoke Post. They support this show. Support them. And I'm going to support you. This is your show. Well, and, and just, well, they'll jack you up later. But right now, yes, the box of awesome you got to support. And also, what are we supporting over there on the Arcadian Vanguard Network this week? Another fine week of programming on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. Of course, get the wrestling news. Get your wrestling news each and every day delivered right to you, get it directly from thewrestlingnews.com or wherever you find your favorite podcast, look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News for your free daily morning wrestling newscast with no opinion, no conjecture, just the actual wrestling news. Once again, Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News or thewrestlingnews.com. Want to make mention this week, stick to wrestling with John McAdam, a look at 35 years ago, Great American Bash 1988. Some of the things you'll hear discussed include, was the Maryland State Athletic Commission in on the finish of the main event? <laughs> was the Tower of Doom the most overcomplication in wrestling history? Ronnie Garvin's clumsy and senseless heel turn. Should this have been Lex Luger's coronation? And Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard blossoming into an all-time great tag team. Great American Bash 88. Wait a minute. What about, what about the Midnight Express and the Fantastics with yours truly up in the cage above the ring? That's not listed here in the format, so I can't oh, comment on that. son of a bitch. Well, find out if that man in the cage above the ring is mentioned. Stick to wrestling with John McAdam 
at mcadampod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! (laughs) And does Colin Thompson owe you money? But go through the archives today at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts, The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! I won't ask you to spoil it, but tell me off the air whether they come to the conclusion that the commission was in on it or was not in on it, and I'll tell you whether they were right or not. Bash 88, do you see that as a positive event or as a, it could have been better? (sighs) There's so many weird things on that show. It was the the first full coverage pay-per-view that Turner Broadcasting helped out with the cable systems to get Crockett coverage, so financially it was the first good one that they had done and people watched it, but uh, you know, there were some great performances, but up and down the car, there were also some things that maybe didn't get over too good, but coming out of that, the Luger and flair rematches actually did draw money at the, at the house shows. And even, you know, I mentioned the midnight and fantastics match. That was kind of, it wasn't as good of a blow off as it could have been because the baby faces couldn't win because Dusty was sending us to Tully and Arn after for the world tag title in the heel tag dream match. So they beat us in the, in the regular house show matches in the bash. They beat us every night because it was three on two bunkhouse matches and they could beat me. But Dusty wanted to make sure that they got a, the midnight got a win on the broadcast event where it counted. So I dropped the chain out of the, I think out of the cage to, no, I was in a straight jacket. I couldn't even drop it, but nevertheless, the midnight fucked the fantastics and beat them in the match. And then when they got me out of the cage, the fantastics got to whip me to kind of get some revenge, but the midnight had to win there because we were headed toward Tully and Arn for the world tag title after the bash was over. If Tully, and so, Arn didn't, uh, if Tully and Arn didn't leave, do you think you get all the way to Starcade with them? Oh, God, yes. It would have gone longer than that. The fucking... Uh, again, the double main event of Flair and Luger for the world title and Tully and Arn against the Midnight for the tag title was drawing bigger houses in the September house shows than the Bash did in July and first part of August, which had never happened before. And we had just really started it when they left. So it would have it would have gone past Starcade. It would have been, I mean, that would have been a big landmark match of some kind in the program. But it would have been going for a while because it wouldn't have gotten old with the, those four guys in the ring. The matches wouldn't have gotten old, and I think me and JJ could have probably figured out a few things to talk about for three or four months. So, yeah. Hey, one last thing on this, Jim. What do you think of Ron Garvin turning heel on Dusty there? And of course, Ron would, Ronnie. Would leave uh, the NWA right after that, briefly in the AWA, and then go to the WWF. But what did you think of the idea of him turning on Dusty? Well, I don't know really what was planned, because it obviously didn't come off. The turn, it, 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 it wasn't a big deal in itself. It wasn't a major angle. That's why probably most people don't remember it. And, you know, and it also, it never went anywhere because he left. But I don't know what Dusty had planned. Ronnie Garvin in his day was a very good heel. Um, Don't know whether it would work there or not, and I don't know. Maybe it's just because Dusty wanted to work with Ronnie since, you know, uh, Flair was going to be tied up with Luger and, uh, you know, trying to just use another name that he had on the roster to do something with. But I don't know what they were going to do. But I don't know if many people were... I think of the two, when they found out that they weren't going to get Tully and Arn versus the Midnight, they probably were more upset about that than they weren't going to get Dusty and Ronnie Garvin. All right, well, that was Bash 88. Hear it on Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam this week. And that was your dissertation on those other podcasts. So now we get to the show that's just right, don't we? We got the, the shows that are too hot and the shows that are too cold. The shows that are too fat, the shows that are too skinny, but we get to Saturday night, which is all right for fighting, and Collision is the show that apparently we're finding out 
Each week is the one that's just right. It's just in the middle. It's not boring and it's not chaos. You can sit in and, and understand and examine some things and it registers with you a bit. Doesn't just go by you at 100 miles an hour like goddamn, you know, a speeding train. And you can't beat Elton John right, with whatever the rest of this stuff is. But when we went on the air, or, or before we went on the air, it was yesterday, as a matter of fact, you said to me, it was, because it was before Collision aired, just last night, as we're speaking here now, you said to me, well, they, the card they've advertised doesn't really look gripping or impressive compared to what they've done over the past few weeks with the great tag team match and the six mans with Punk and everything. And remember I said, remember when most wrestling shows the, that were good and that you enjoyed, if they had advertised every, the, everything beforehand, it, it, you know, it wouldn't have been as good. Or how did I say that? Sometimes the better wrestling shows, if you'd advertised the shit beforehand, it wouldn't have looked as good because you wouldn't have seen how they got there. That's what I said. Right. And part of what I was saying, too, was the fact that they're right down the road from me in Newark, and I hadn't heard anything about this. I didn't even realize they were in Newark this week. Well, but at the same time, you live in a gated community, so they can't put flyers in the mailboxes. See, I got you there. That, it, <laughs> I wasn't asking for flyers in the mailbox. Well, you'd get more pizza coupons that way, too, if you didn't have that fucking nasty guard down at the fucking bottom of the hill. You said coupons. Where do you stand on coupons versus coupons? It's a coupon. It's a coupon. It's a coupon. Don't don't ruin coupons for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin it by saying it a different way? Yes. And I can I'll hold this over your head. It right. I'll say it again this way unless you sign a deal with Podcast One. Well, now that, that's extortion. <laughs> that's a strong arm tactic. No, no, no. I also have you under an invisible NDA. You're not allowed to tell anyone about this strong arm tactic. And I expect oh, you to fulfill your obligations to me. In that case, it's entirely legal. Oh, but anyway, where were we before coupons? <laughs> oh, the advertising was suspect for this event. <laughs> and as well, they didn't advertise a big card. But here's the thing I'm going to say before we go into this. You got a, Tony Khan loves to advertise every goddamn time that one of the talents going to take a bowel movement in a commercial on the shows, right? And all the graphics and the endless names and the rapid fire delivery. And over across the street in the WWE, you know that when you watch the program, chances are the people that wander out in the first segment, 85 to 90% of the time, they're going to end up in a fucking match at, by the end. So you got all the way one way there and all the way the other way there. Don't advertise shit, advertise everything. Here they've been advertising the, the main event matches, but now on this episode of Collision, they didn't advertise the legitimate main event, the punk match, they made it in the first segment. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Now you're not really going to know if you see the advertised card for collision and a match doesn't tickle your taint. You can go, but you know what? They put punk and fucking Starks and about the last time. I won't know unless I tune in. And then, so it's, it, that's what you're supposed to have a mixture Sometimes these things evolve organically from an interesting interview, not a, fucking by rote scripted promo and sometimes it's advertised because it's been led to and it's a major match but you never know so you gotta tune in to find out what's gonna happen and in the first segment they had tony shivani who is the interviewer now i guess uh, the live interviewer but they took your advice from some time back i'm starting to regret that advice he's starting to slip well well but at the same time at least it's it's better than hearing more of him. They B-rolled the win that uh, Starks had over Punk last week, and he disrespected Jushin Liger. And I wrote, it's almost like they're trying to explain what's going on, and it makes sense. It's amazing. So Tony asked Starks about all the controversy. But meanwhile, the fans are chanting, you deserve it, because they know that Starks cheated, but still they wanted to see Starks get ahead, and they're they're going to be starting to pick up on that he's switching heel. 
because he agreed with him. Yeah, I do deserve it. And he had a Louis Vuitton satchel there. And he, what's in my bag? Nothing. I just bought a new, a new, a new Louis Vuitton bag. A new Vuitton? A new, it's a new Vuitton. It's a, a new, <laughs> it's an offshoot brand. He got it in, at boxofawesome.com. No, he did not. They have real brands there. Not Louis Vuitton or new Vuitton. Well, Louis well, like, Vuitton's a real brand, but they don't have hey, that at Boxofawesome. You, you know what? When I was in TNA, uh, the only time that I've... Uh, What's that goddamn bag the uh, that all of the rich people have and used to have in the wrestling business years ago with the initials all over it? The three initials, the goddamn um, fancy luggage with three initials. Oh, goddamn, you know it's got... This, this is a great story. It's got, it's got the initials all over it. I've forgotten the name of them now, but Jeremy Borash got me one of those. <laughs> They regularly are like $1,500 or whatever, but he knew somebody that had black market shit of this brand that was the, somebody that worked at the factory went in at night and made their own shit out of the real materials and then sold them under the table. So I got one of these $1,500 bags for like $100. What kind of bag is it? It's one of those bags with the initials all over it. Whose initials? I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the name. I thought you'd know having all this fancy shit in your own home. <laughs> and he plugged his Prada shoes too. <laughs> I know I've, I've heard about the Prada shoes. They named it after the goddamn, uh, the, the newspaper, the house organ of the communist party, Prada. No, no, that's Pravda, not Prada. All right. Well, he plugged his new Vuitton bag in his Pravda shoes. And then he said anybody else would have done the same thing he did, win by any means necessary. And he started talking about how sexy he was, and the fans are still cheering it, but he's he's got some oomph as a heel, and you can see they're going to go with this a little bit. And he doesn't want to be a pillar, and blah, blah, blah. And as he was talking, here came Punk with no music, and his name had just not been mentioned five seconds beforehand. He's just tired of this goddamn prick that cheated to beat him last week, running his dick liquor, and he's coming out to goddamn complain about it. They got Imagine along. Imagine that. They got along. Remember, the first main event of Collision was that eight-man tag match with FTR, Punk, and Ricky Starks. Yes. And then suddenly he gets shanked in the ribs. And again, Punk comes out, and it's Newark. So you got the pros and the cons. A lot of cons in Newark. And the, he gets a reaction. It's the biggest positive and biggest negative reaction at the same time. And they're trying to outdo themselves. And Punk's playing with it. He said, I'm not mad except at myself. I'm, you know, I'm proud of you. I've cheated too. So have the people of New Jersey and they boo him. And then he knocked the New Jersey devils not getting out of the first round. And he, but he finally says, because he's just being him, he's not necessarily being a baby face or a heel. He's CM Punk truth teller. I can live with the loss. Can you live with the win knowing that you can't beat me without cheating? And then Punk turns around to leave and he's walking out. And Stark says, my bag is as empty as yours. And that gets him to turn back around. He comes back and gets back in the ring. And now they're chanting CM Punk, CM Punk. Because he's been, and see, we're going somewhere, obviously with the bag that Punk was carrying that allegedly contained the belt. And now they're talking about he's the champ. He never lost the title. So Punk turns back and gets in Starks' face and says, you want a, a shot at what's in, what's in the bag, Ricky? Or are you like Max and you just don't want me to have it? I'm the real world champion. And he's starting to get into that. Should he have had the bag with him if they're going to reference it? He's brought it to the ring before. He's had well, it with, but, with him but, in promos before. Well, and I think he should when he comes on purpose on his time and it's scheduled. But when he just had all he could stand and he doesn't, you know, he just came out to tell somebody off. I don't think he needs it because that's. That's when it starts getting hokey that people have, you know, well, I know so-and-so's back there eating his third piece of cake at catering, and he comes out five seconds later carrying the belt. Is it glued to his hand? You know, anyway. Um, Depends on what's in catering. True. 
But now they they got good catering now these days over in the WWF. We know that much. We're not talking WWF. Well, I know, but I'm just saying it. De- it just depends. Cage and Dino come out, and they interrupt and say, "This is taking too long. We're required to be here, but we don't want to have to sit through all this." And then Cage, who is holding the TNT belt that Dino Douche won, asks, "What kind of guy carries a title that he didn't win?" And then as that's happening, and Cage is being a good heel, here comes Darby. And he snatches Christian's microphone on the way to the ring and gets in the ring and talks to Starks too. And calls Punk his good friend and puts his arm around him. So, <laughs> this is... <laughs> it watching watching the, the talent that knows what the fuck is going on and are kind of with it, playing with the crowd reactions that the buckaroos and their fans have have foisted off on them does my heart good. You know, beyond the split reaction to Punk, show-wide so far on Collision, it's pretty defined who the baby faces and who the heels are. Yes, which makes Punk the special one and puts more attention on the reaction that he gets. So they've they've helped, they've handed him something to help him out. They didn't mean to, but nevertheless, Darby says he's going to become the new TNT champion at All Out, and he starts, he's cut a good promo. Darby is coming out of his little, his shell, his cocoon, his coffin, whatever he was fucking wrapped up in for all that time. When he's in front of people and he's got something to work with. And he suggested a tag team match and got the fans to want the match. And everything that has been said here amongst all these people fit and made sense. And it wasn't just like we've we've got a match, let's send some guys to talk until we make it. It it made sense for it to be that way, right? So then Tony Khan, of course, had made it official by the time they stopped speaking, but uh, through Tony Schiavone, he had sent word. But the the basically the main event doesn't have to be advertised every week. If it's good and if it's set up logically, it's also less expected that way, and you never it's less expected than the way WWE usually does it. And you can, you know, you can tell you got to watch the show to see everything that's going to happen. You don't know everything ahead of time, and they're trying to put enough interest in the actual matches where you want to see the fucking thing rather than, okay, when's it going to end so another promo can start? I don't know what you think of this whole deal. I thought it was an okay open. Again, they didn't bill CM Punk as wrestling. Uh, you know, even like FTR, they were, you know, I think in the announcements beforehand, it was just, we'll hear from FTR. And from AEW history, you're taught that that doesn't necessarily mean they'll be there. It could just be a video. Remember, we'll hear from CM Punk on Rampage. And it would just be like a 30-second <laughs> video of him talking about a match on there. I think they can cure that if they would put the word live in. We'll hear live from FTR. Yeah, I think so. But, you know, on the other hand, we thought Punk would be there. It's Collision. They're back in the States. There was no Punk match build. So, yeah, the people booed Punk. Some of them did. Some, A lot of them cheered him, too. But in, at the end of the day, everyone was happy you're actually going to get a match with him. And to the point earlier, they didn't build this big match. But if you were watching or you were there live, you reacted to the idea that all of a sudden you got it. And that's there needs to be a mixture on wrestling television. It's not like a pay-per-view or a big event where you're trying to sell tickets to a house show or even a big premium live event where you just want people to watch it because it's for this is this is an infomercial that you make interesting. And now, obviously in the modern day, you're getting paid for television, but you still can't make every week. The great, you know, Nick Goulas's greatest, greatest card I've ever signed. He said that every week for 40 years. Anyway, Andre is barred from the arena in this, this week's episode because last week he obviously was causing chaos, trying to get his mask back from the house of black and the security guards were not great. Thespians here. But I enjoy that they tie up all the loose ends, like where would this fucking guy be, right? In 
when the House of Black is going to be around. Yeah. So just 45 seconds and it makes sense. It makes the show make sense. I don't want to go to Newark. Let's do a, <laughs> do a pre-tape here. If, if I have to go to Newark, I'll punch Sammy. So then we had a tag team match with Gin and Juice against Action Andretti and Darius Martin, the other Martin. And this, again, it was great because it's a top heel tag team that's just started in the company facing an exciting underneath babyface team to have a good match and get a good solid win. Which is the way every tag team should start out and every single wrestler should start out. And they shine the baby faces a bit and they let them do their gymnastics because that's their thing. And every match on the card didn't, you know, give you a nonstop diet of that. And then they cut off action and got some heat on him and they went through the break. And then when they came back, action fought back and hit a hot tag. Apparently, whoever the agents are or producers or creative major domos here are encouraging people to actually have wrestling matches with hot tags and maybe they're walking through these things possibly because how the fuck would action andretti and darius martin know how to do a hot tag from watching the wednesday night program they never do them uh darius made a big comeback did some nice stuff they got their mandatory dives in but they got did them quickly and only one each because they're baby faces. And then the heel stopped them and hit Action Andretti with a couple of moves and White hit his finish, one, two, three. And the only and it wasn't that a long match, but it was exciting while it lasted. And they didn't bury the referee. They didn't need furniture. They didn't fight endlessly on the floor. The criticism I will give is they did too many moves by the heels to the single baby face right in front of the referee at the end, before Jay White hit his finish, there was a kick from one guy and a thing from the other guy. They're just doing things back and forth to one guy. And they need a tag team finish instead of Jay White's thing, which looks like the crossroads. Why wouldn't they have a rocket launcher, a flapjack, a double goozle, a vegematic, a fucking grave day, some tag team finish that they're going to start establishing to win the match when they're a tag team? That is my only criticism. It was fine for what it was. It was a spotlight match for Gin and Juice. They looked really good. I think for guys like Darius Martin and Action Andretti, despite all the wonderful things Chris Jericho did for his career, working on this show and hopefully learning from some of the people on this show will teach them what they need because if you're only surrounded by Let's just say dynamite, <laughs> for lack of a better term. <laughs> if you're only surrounded by dynamite. Then you need to tiptoe carefully. And I think if you're here, you know, these guys, you know, if they work with FTR, for instance, they're not going to be able to get away with everything they would do more than likely on a match on dynamite. This wasn't FTR, it was Jay and Juice, uh, Jay, yeah, it's Juice Robinson. Jay White and Juice Robinson here. But still, I think working on this show, working in a show that, based on everything we're hearing, is kind of led by CM Punk can only be good for some of these young wrestlers who need skills beyond jumping, beyond yes. flipping. So that's good. I'll say this too. I've been a big fan of uh, Juice Robinson so far. Jay White is uh, starting to really become a favorite of mine too in the ring. Well, they're, they're, getting, they're getting their feet under them in the new company. They've had great tag matches. They're starting to get a little reputation. When they first introduced them they just came out of nowhere and were just you know blah like everybody else that starts yeah. on the program you're supposed to know who they are and what yeah. they're about but you don't and now that they're being featured and being fleshed out you know because we, we've been saying there needs to be a team to work with ftr they need a top heel tag team this is a wrestling team that obviously can go with ftr anyway then we had middle and Bless him. Miro's on his way to the ring, and I've worried about this guy. I don't know where he went. I was thinking, did he get deported? I don't even know where he's from. But what? But Nick Comodato is back. Remember Comodato solo a go go. That's right. Well, they did. They didn't wake us up before a go go a went went, and solo 
is gone so low that now he's with QT. But here comes Nick Comodato. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy was jacked up. He looked like a caveman when we saw him last time. Now he's got new gear. He's still jacked up. He looks nice. And they're going to give him a little something. I couldn't tell from what was done here whether he is majorly progressed in his in-ring wrestling skills and stylings. I maybe saw a couple things that made me think, ooh, but uh, I can't form a full opinion. But he came down the aisleway and jumped. Now, Miro is, I guess, is Miro a babyface now that he's won his fight with God? I think Miro's one of those wrestlers that's not defined in any category, but obviously he's a babyface to the fans because they go nuts whenever he's even mentioned. Or whenever they think they're going to get him on a show. So whenever they see him, they pop for him, but obviously he behaves somewhat like a heel. Well, Comorado, knowing that Miro's a dangerous man, jumped him from behind in the aisleway. So I guess that kind of makes Comorado a heel, too. And he uh, rolls him in and gives him kind of a sloppy move and a cover, and Miro kicks out, and Comorado gets a little heat, and then, boom! Miro comes back with the German and a kick, and the fans go ballistic, and he gets the camel clutch, and... Comodato tapped out. And it was just what they needed. Miro defeated a, a you know, in, a, in quick fashion, dominantly defeated somebody and, you know, shows what he can do. And they had, because of Comorado's physical presence, they had to give him something. But I'm thinking the, the fact that he looks like that and they chose him to do this indicates that maybe... He looks great, and he found a better seamstress, but his wrestling ain't getting any better. Or elsewise, there'd be something else for a guy that looks like that. Well, that's the big question, because he looks like the kind of guy that Bill Watts would have fallen in love with. Big guy, size. A big guy that he would have fallen in love with? Fallen in love with. Maybe he maybe he is a felon. Maybe that's what's holding him Why back. Why don't they that's he what get it into is. Canada or something? But, you know, he's been in one of the QT guys. They still reference QT on commentary here, so I don't know if he technically is still under the QT Marshall banner or the factory, whatever it is. but I don't know if that's a banner or a ribbon. But he's been there, what, at least three years now. We rarely ever see him. You would think at this point, if he had something to show, we would have seen it. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with him. But again, the only other thing I would think is, he did lose the Miro, but he is on collision. If there was ever a place to repair him and try something new with him, this would be it. But again, maybe, he lo- but he lost here, so who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe he can be the guy the, that stands in the back and says little and pulls out a shank when time is, gets rough. What? I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, after Miro beat the piss out of Comorado, you know what old Nick's going to need, don't you? I don't know. He's going to need some of the products from our friends at CB Distillery. Now, I know what your folks are going to say. You're going to say CB Distillery. We haven't heard about That's because they are one of the new friends that we have made since we've gotten away from some of our old felons. And the new friends at CB Distillery make scientifically formulated ingredients that will help you with better sleep, stress, and anxiety, less pain after physical activity. And that's what old Nick needs there. He needs less pain than he's got right now after that physical activity. And if you folks suffer from pain after exercise, 80% of the people taking the CBD products from CB distilleries, they report less pain after physical activity. Could you use more calm? 81% of the people say CBD helps with stress and anxiety. If you need better sleep, well, 90% of the customers report better sleep with CBD and 3% of the people report getting their prison sentences reduced for good behavior by taking these fine products. If it'll make you act nicer in prison, imagine how pleasant you'll feel in the privacy of your own home. Why are you talking about prison? 
Well, I said 3% of the people report getting their prison sentences reduced for good behavior. You didn't hear about that part? Well, let's talk about the other parts, which are the parts where this could help you, whether it's something like you're sore from wrestling Miro or something like yeah. you're having trouble sleeping because you're having these nightmares yeah. about Miro. Stress, anxiety, all caused by Miro. But then also, you know, you don't want to you don't want to serve your whole prison sentence either. So if you're right now locked up in Sing Sing or Joliet and you take some CBD products from CBD distillery, well, you're going to behave much better. You're going to be practically putty in their hands. You're going to go along with anything and in the, you'll get out on good behavior. Well, I don't know you about that. Also enjoy better focus and concentration. That's probably what we should do now. Yeah. Is focus and concentrate on telling people how how wonderful the products from CB Distillery are. Well, you got that that whole box of stuff. They've got the gummies, they've got uh, the the drippage. They've got to, it's liquid, animal, vegetable, or mineral. There's all kinds of products here. They're packed with whole body healing plant compounds and vital nutrients, and it's 100% clean in ingredients. No artificial colors, no artificial flavors, no preservatives, no dirt. There's no dirt. It, it's 100% clean. Well, 100% clean ingredients. They don't put any, right. any dirt, any filth. Dirt. Not even any dust. It's why would 100% you e clean. Why would you even bring these things into the conversation? Dirt and dust. Well, that's because things that are not clean or dirty. And they have, that would mean they have dirt in them. Well, this stuff is 100% clean. No dirt. Well, I'm going to... I'm going to, you know, test this out right now. Here are the sleep synergy gummies. I'm going to eat a few of these right now. Hey. Let's hope I'll be gone before the end. Going, you, well, I'm hoping I'll miss the end of the show if I do this. You'll go to sleep before you hear all the rest of my brilliance. Am I causing you stress and anxiety? Take a couple of these things. That will go away. I'm focusing more on the sleep synergy than I am the stress and the anxiety. I just want a good night's. I would like a good 12-hour night's sleep. Well, I got one last night, and I'll tell you what, they're fine. I actually <laughs> wanted to roll over and go for 12 more hours, but I didn't. I ran out of my CB gummies, or CBD gummies, courtesy CB of distillery. CB Distillery. That's right. See, it's all about CB. Elderberry, this flavor. Oh, you got the elderberry? Elderberry. Of all the berries, it's the oldest. My grandmother used to smell like elderberries. And here's another thing. The products that come from CB Distillery are recommended by Mayo Clinic trained internist and preventative health specialist, Dr. Kevin Fry. I have it on good authority. Not only is he obviously a doctor trained at the Mayo Clinic and a health specialist, but also can harmonize just like his older brother, Glenn. So if Dr. Kevin Fry is going to tell you what to do, you better do it because he's got over 2 million satisfied customers. Or does CB Distillery have over 2 million Satisfied. It'd been hard for one doctor to see two million people, wouldn't it's it? It's CB Distillery with all these happy customers. Well, we didn't say happy. They're satisfied. Satisfied. Yeah. And potentially happy. Potentially happy. But one day they they felt fine and dandy. Normally they usually feel fine, but not particularly dandy. And sometimes they feel dandy, but not necessarily fine. But there was one day they took the gummies from CB Distillery. They felt both fine and dandy. But they also then felt they, a little crummy, so they needed more CB Distillery gummies. Well, and that's that's when they they took that survey. Let let us get you on the right path, folks, with our twenty percent discount. Yes, you can get these fine products recommended by Glenn Fry's younger brother, Doctor Kevin Fry, and you're going to get twenty percent off at the same time if you go to cbdistillery.com and enter the code JCE for your discount. There's no prescription required. So that's a load off your mind. Payment is required. That's one thing that, that you ain't going to find a loophole in. You're not going to get around that one. The no prescription thing was easy, but payment, you're going to be forking over. But you're going to get 20% off if you go to cbdistillery.com and use the promo code JCE. Does everybody know how to spell distillery? Probably not. Let's do it. D-I-S-T-I-L-L-E-R-Y. It's, it's a place where the, you distill things. It's an array where you distill CB. 
An re? An re where you distill CB. <laughs> CB distillery. CBD. Not CB. Well, then there'd be another D in there. It would be CBD distillery, and that would be wrong. That would take you to someplace else completely that won't give you your 20% off, and Dr. Kevin Fry's not behind it. So go to cbdistillery.com and use the promo code JCE. You'll get 20% off. Dr. Fry will be happy. And you don't need a prescription. You do need money. <laughs> That's right. And take that money, CB the story. Yes. Remember? <laughs> they don't do that. Say? And remember, well, you sounded hot. I'm not hot. I was going to say CB Distillery supports this show. So, of course, support CB Distillery. They are our friends and your friends. We're, get, we're getting a lot of support these days. Yes. CB Distillery is one of the four pillars that supports us. We need a lot of support. We are the double D's of professional wrestling podcasts. That's true. Boy, we need that. We need the, cr the cross beam under there and we need the suspension bridge. We need support <laughs> of all kinds. As a matter of fact, we're going to have eight pillars here next week. Eight. Eight. Well, we got we got more than four sponsors that have already signed up. Hey, what would you think? Of, you know, we didn't even mention it during the Ricky Starks interview, them bringing up the whole pillars thing. Well, yeah, because he didn't want to be a pillar. Because, you know, he's going to hold the place up all by himself. I think he needs to be the post. Oh. Well, we're somehow going from CB Distillery back to Collision Distillery. Or I thought you meant back to Bespoke Post. No. See, I mentioned post while you mentioned pillar. Ah. From pillar to post. Well, your post toasties are uh, sitting on the table, so let's get to the rest of Collision. If you got a good sturdy post, you only need one. But if you have pillars, you got to have four of them. So we, we came back to a video on the legacy of FTR with highlights and et cetera. And that's nice, putting talent over that's on the program. Imagine that. <laughs> that was the best video they've ever done for FTR. Well, yeah, because it's the only time they've ever tried. Other than reminding everyone that Tully was there. Yeah, that's true. It, it was a little awkward. Nevertheless, then again, we've called them in the past the House of Blech. But now they're doing a spooky entrance, but it's not, they're not popping up on a, on a screen and answering people like they're live when it's obviously a pre-tape. It's not a David Copperfield vanishing routine. They're not stepping into the box and then the box falls open and there's nobody there and they've been transported over to the fucking La Brea tar pits. They're three tattooed, weird-looking guys and Julia Hart uh, that do a spooky entrance and they're having matches. So I can deal with this. And they B-rolled again, Andre trying to get the mask back from last week. And that's why he's barred from the building. And their opponents for the six-man tag team title were the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn. And we mentioned, Brian, that the Acclaimed, since they got real popular because Caster's raps and the personality and the scissors thing with Billy Gunn, and then Tony really didn't know how to capitalize on it, but the mistake he made was putting the tag team title on them because it was, they weren't ready for it yet in the ring, and in the people's eyes, they weren't ready to be the top tag team, even if they were the most popular tag team. And then they were working for the tag team title against the Guns, who, again, have all the potential in the world, but were greener than pepper trees, and it wasn't ready to put them in that kind of spotlight and that kind of pressure. And then the tag team division went to shit because the greenest teams on the pepper tree were fighting for the belts while everybody else was being made into six-man teams to satisfy the self-indulgent masturbatory fantasies of the EVPs that wanted to have their own belts and play with their friends instead of jumping into the deep end of the pool. And since then, the acclaimed and Billy have been floating basically on the rap and the scissoring and have had nothing really going on of any dramatic nature. Did I encapsulate that as well as could be expected? I think so. I wasn't too excited about this match, and a lot of it was because I've lost a lot of the enthusiasm, if not all of it, for the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. Well, but now that it seems like they're going to do something. So we'll see what happens, because 
Caster rapped and Buddy didn't like it and jumped out on the floor and just started kicking the shit out of him. And they got into a big six way. And okay, again, now there's six guys and they're fighting all over the place and they're on the floor. This is the brawl match. Wild inside and out. We're 50 minutes into the program. We haven't had that yet. So, and that's, it's the House of Black. Okay. Now it may be called for. It's another course in your five course dinner not a hot dog eating contest where that's all you get you binge on one fucking thing over and over until you puke so again they got some heat on caster they made a tag to billy gun he made a big comeback and malachi black hit him with a spin kick one two three wasn't that long was fairly wild a lot of action no funny shit and then Malachi Black whispers to Billy Gunn, and so did Buddy. I didn't see what Brody did, but the heels walk out, and Billy starts taking his boots off. And as the fans start seeing it, they're chanting, no, no, and the response built, and it takes a while to unlace those boots, right? So they start chanting, you've still got it. And that got louder, but Billy took his boots off and left him in the middle of the ring and walked right out past the acclaimed. So either that... They're doing something, obviously, to tease his retirement or to give... He's either going to retire, which would kind of be anticlimactic, but, but people will buy that he would because of his age and his, you know, the fact that he's been doing this forever. Or it's a re-motivational tool to repackage or have him find new, new purpose or whatever, which may or may not include the acclaimed, and there could be some drama there. So at least we'll see what's going to happen instead of... They didn't scissor for the first time in ages. That's what we got out of this, thankfully. It took him forever to get those boots off. Well, he's got long legs. This is TV. Well, what was he supposed to do? Take a box cutter and just slit the fucking laces? Yeah, that, I guess. That, I guess. That wouldn't be a full-fledged retirement. I'm just not enthusiastic about this. I'm killing it. But at least they're doing something to move this along instead of being stale. Yes. I give them that. Yes. And at least so, the House of Black, I'm not crazy about them, especially with the trio stuff, but we've seen tag matches. We've seen Buddy in singles matches. Brody King was in a singles match. Like you said. You want to give him a big spooky entrance like that? I'm cool with it. But if it ends there and they just wrestle, then I'm really good with it. No science fiction. No lights out and I've vanished. No promo. I'm facing the other way and there's smoke and I don't know what I'm looking at. None of this shit anymore. Just wrestling. Nothing where it looks like the middle of the Bohemian Rhapsody video is what you're saying. That's right. That's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. That's good. <laughs> oh, mama mia, mama mia. Let me go. Yeah. Let my people go. All right. Well, we're going to let our people go to the nine o'clock hour where Tony Schiavone was in the ring with FTR. And they do a promo because next week it's going to be them against Adam Cole and MJF on collision, thankfully. And, you know, they're basically telling the story that, and by the way, did you hear Cash mention the Young Bucks? He was talking about all the top teams they've faced and mentioned the Young Bucks, and it got big boos. So apparently in Newark, they may be wanting to boo and cheer punk, but they only want to hoot at the fucking buckaroos. When was the last time the Bucks got a big reaction where they weren't right next to Kenny Omega? Um including at home in bed, I think. Uh, probably not. Not been a while now. But anyway, um, they tell the story, look, does anybody trust MJF? And the fans chant no. <laughs> but they acknowledge that you people are liking MJF and Adam Cole right now, and that's fine. But does anybody trust him? No. And Cash tells Adam what MJF is really like. He's a devil. Don't trust him. And Dax agrees with that and likens MJF and Adam to the rich kids that used to make fun of him for being poor and having a job at the fucking Jiffy Mart. And 
he mentioned this is not going to be your comedy skits. This is not going to be your, your dance routines. We take this seriously, and you're not. So next week is going to be no comedy. It's going to be an ass kicking. And they did a good promo to sell the match from their perspective. Nobody came in and jumped anybody. We didn't have any attempted murders here. They promoted next week's match. Uh, uh, fine, short, and sweet. What'd you think? Yeah, it was an all right promo. I thought Cash did pretty good. We don't hear him talk as much. I think he's actually a better talker than Dax when you actually put them both one after the other. I'm going to go back to something I said last week. I think FTR have, or maybe close to, using up everything they needed to as babyfaces, and it's time for them to turn. I think there's a, a natural aggression that they're showing, yeah. and I think they're stronger as heels and babyfaces, especially if they're working with MJF and Cole. That's a babyface tag team. Right well, now, that's a babyface tag team. But now here's the thing. I'd love to get another match with Jen and Juice out of this before FTR yes. would switch heel. But I think and they have to. But should FTR switch heel against Adam Cole and MJF? Because that team cannot last long. Because MJF is the singles world champion. And I know everybody only works one time a week now. But also, again, as we talked about, if FTR turn heel on MJF and Adam Cole, that means MJF and Adam Cole are the baby faces. That means that... Well I'm, not, you know, I, I, I'm just I, using that one match as an example because I don't think MJF and Adam Cole are going to be on this show every week, and I think FTR are. Well, yeah. So you're saying you're saying work like heels rather than turn heel. No, I think they should match. turn. I think it may not be right away, but I think within the next couple okay, months. Okay, but I'm talking about not in this match. Not in They're this not match. Not going to turn heel on no. MJF and Adam Cole. No, okay. I don't think that. All right, we're think, straightening out what we're saying. But I think they should be heels again. They should eventually. I don't disagree with you there, except that then. <laughs> They've just now got uh, Jay White and Juice Robinson to work with. If they switch heel, who are they going to work with? After they do that, I think you do something maybe, and you do them against... If you're not going to get Punk and them or someone against the Elite, I think the next interesting thing to do before Punk MJF is Punk and someone versus FTR. Hmm. And I bet you those would be great matches. I bet you those would be dynamic matches. Might be interesting. Maybe you're on to something. You have a track record of sniffing these things out. My nose is clogged. I was in the pool all weekend. Oh, yeah. In the, you know you realize that you're just, you're just swimming in people's urine at that point, right? In my own pool? Oh, I thought you were at a pool. I didn't no. know you were in your pool. I so you're only swimming in your... How, how many kids you got? I got four kids. They're You're not peeing in the in pool. They're not urine. peeing in the pool. Do you put the goddamn shit in there that turns purple? What? Do you put the shit in there that turns purple if somebody pisses in the pool? <laughs> and how do you <laughs> know the that they're not pissing? In? You're relying on kids to tell you the truth about whether they're pissing in the pool. My youngest daughter literally says, I have to pee and gets out of the pool to go to the bathroom. But see, that's to lull you into a false sense of security. That way, the other three, meanwhile, are just, God, they're just, they're just spraying everywhere right under the water, and you don't even know it. Do you pee in the pool? Of course. Of course. Everybody pees in the pool. When you go to a hotel pool, you're peeing in the pool? Of course. Because it makes you, you're, you're under, you're in running water. It makes you have to piss. Running it's, water? It's, this pool is running water. It's human nature. Okay. Well, it's circulating. There's some coming in and some going out because people are pissing in it. So they try to filter it. It's only when you notice it's only when they puke at a hotel pool that they close it. For the record, I stay in my own pool that I own and I'm certain that no one is currently pissing in it. Do you use the purple stuff? I, I don't even know what purple stuff you're talking about. You've never heard that story? Oh, for God's sake. When you were a kid and your mom or your dad or whoever would take you to the fucking swimming pool when you were a kid, wherever your pool was that you went to or that they took you to when you were a kid. It was called the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, well, see, then you've missed out on this because when my mom, like everybody down south especially, and people that don't live right next to the ocean, when you take a kid to the pool, you tell them, now listen, you know that this place here that owns this pool, they put... The chemical in the water, if you piss, it's going to turn purple. Immediately around you, there's going to be a giant purple cloud all around you. It's going to tell everybody 
that can see that within a hundred yards that you've just pissed all over yourself in that pool. And won't you be embarrassed? You don't want that to happen, do you? And they say, oh no, mommy. Oh no, daddy. Well, don't piss in the pool or it's going to happen. You never heard that. I have not heard that. I'm sorry that you had to go through this. You know what they call that stuff that makes the fucking water turn purple? <laughs> what do they call it? Nothing. It don't exist. <laughs> But all every kid until they're fucking 18 years old or with the, when the internet came around, I guess you can look it up. Every kid is told that and it puts fear in them of public humiliation over public your 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 urination, your 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 urination. Well, that was the FTR promo. It was pretty good. Public urination and humiliation. It was better than Ty of Valkyrie and Sky Blue. <sighs> Ty is a heel now. She looks great. She uses the size advantage. She's condescending. She's got that bitchy, lilting promo voice. Oh my gosh, New Jersey, you're worse than I thought. Kind of a valley girl thing. She won the match with a surfboard stomp. And I get... <sighs> the only thing I could say is that she's not Charlotte, but she's better than Jane Cargill. But it, it, it ain't... <sighs> I don't know. Something's not happening. It doesn't. I mean, the fans are just happy to stare at Sky Blue's fanny the whole match. Let's be honest about what's going on here. <laughs> there are videos. The creepiest fans. You like know, by the way, hold on now. By the way, I know from managing Adrian Street and Miss Linda that for our international audience, we should say that the fanny in the United States is the ass. Yes. Because I found out a long time ago, it has a different meaning in jolly old England. I don't know we want to go there, where they're staring at this poor young teenage girl's fanny. No, the creepiest videos keep coming on my Twitter feed. Like Wrestling fans just, I guess they go to AEW and just film Sky Blue's ass as she's doing everything in the ring. And I think a large part of her appeal is a lot of people just want to see that ass. <laughs> Do you think that she could make a ton of money if she just dressed up in her wrestling gear? I'm not talking about anything naked or sexual or anything. Right. Just dress up in her wrestling gear and just turn her back to the camera and have people do just the photographer just take an eight by 10 close up of her ass and autograph the right ass cheek. Just, you know, two little Johnny love sky blue and she would just she would make a fortune. I mean, if she wanted to just do pictures of her ass, ass, I'm sure pictures. she could make a fortune from some of these fans. Autographed ass pictures. No, they've got to be autographed. Autographed on the ass? Yes. I guess all the picture is, is and I'm, not, I'm talking about start the top of the hold picture on. is no, her well, lower back. Well, hold on. No, and the no, bottom no. of the picture is her upper thighs. It's just a picture of her ass. This is this marketing has never been done like this before. But you and signed... she would autograph just close-ups of her of her ass. But you have signed a lot of autograph photos. You know, there are people who really collect these things. They're a big deal to a lot of people. If you got a ass photo of Sky Blue, yeah. why would you want her to sign it on her ass? Wouldn't you want it next to it so that it didn't actually ruin the photo or ruin what was there? Well, I don't know about ruin and anything, but no, that would add to the value of the photo. And also because it's a close-up, there is no next to the ass. It's just a giant picture of ass. It ass goes from side to side and top to bottom in this picture. Maybe it could say, ask me about my ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Love, sky blue. So anyway, now it's time for our main event of the evening. Ricky Starks and Christian Cage with Dino Douche in the corner against Darby Allen and CM Punk. And if there was any doubt about who the big star is, the first three of them, talented though they are, they enter and then suddenly, like Mussolini, who's going to help Darby? <laughs> He's coming down to help his pal Darby Allen. You know, you know, Darby Allen's music ought to be that old folk song, Barbara Allen, but changed to Darby Allen. And Punk helped his pal, Darby Allen. Not too so many wrestlers, Punk, not too many wrestlers have come to the ring to folk music. We'll see. It's it's a trend that could be growing. With Darby Allen, of all the people to be the spokesman for the folk movement in wrestling, it's Darby Allen. Well, with all of his goth and friends and all the other friends, they sit around and drink coffee and fucking bemoan their misery, don't they? Like Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson, excuse me, seems more like the you know coming to the ring to Tom Dooley or something than 
Darby Allen. The Kingston Trio? That's right. Very good. There you go. Well, Punk was having extra fun with its clobbering time because he got the fucking, again, the big reaction. And there's a CM Punk chant, and there's trying to people trying to boo over it. They rang the bell with 27 minutes left in the show, so they were settling in for it to build a, again, another great main event with four top names in the company. And everybody is clearly defined here. Everybody is being true to their own selves. I'm not going to say their characters. I'm going to say themselves. Christian Cage and Starks argue about who's going to start. Neither one of them wants to. Wants the other one to. Against Punk. And finally Starks gets in and takes one bump and runs over and takes Christian. And then Punk jerks Christian in over the top rope. This is wrestling. We're having a fucking wrestling match. Imagine that. And Punk worked Christian over a little bit and tagged Darby. And then the baby faces, Punk and Darby, started tagging in and out. They've, Christian is, what well, he's got to be, he's Edge's age. He's close to 50. He's been injured. He's not going to be out there doing all this bullshit. He's one of the best workers on a fucking card, and he cuts a hell of a promo, and he's a heel, and he knows what to do. So the baby faces are getting a hell of a reaction from these people while they're, they've got Christian in an arm ringer. And Punk will tag Darby, and the people will cheer, and Darby will crank the arm, and then tag Punk, and the people boo because they, they're booing that he tagged Punk. But then Punk will grab the arm and wind it up and then tag Darby and they'll cheer. And meanwhile, Christian is standing there getting his arm twisted. This is wrestling, folks. And then Christian and Darby do some fucking wrestling. And then Christian goes to tag and Starks doesn't want to. But then when Christian takes over, Starks tags in right away. I, I wrote professionals are calling this. And then Punk does a dive. Because the only dives we've had in this two hours was the goddamn fiery young baby faces that are full of piss and vinegar and do that kind of thing. Punk dives on both of them and then holds them for Darby to climb up and do a coffin drop. And there's their break spot. And the crowd's up. And then they come back and Punk is selling. And Christian's got heat going on him. And then Starks gets in, and they do the dueling chants. Let's go, Ricky, CM Punk. Let's go, Ricky, CM Punk. And Punk's selling and then hits a neck breaker. And he gets the hot, well, he gets a tag to Darby. Nobody tried to stop him, so it wasn't really a hot tag, but the people still popped. Darby makes comeback, dives on Starks, dives on Dino, and bounces off. The dinosaur never moves. That's the way to use the fucking lizard. The big, impressive-looking, mute force standing outside on the floor that can occasionally make an interest, or uh, make a difference, rather. And then they get some heat on Darby. They go through another break. And they come back, and that's Darby's spot. He's selling and fighting from the bottom. And that's where he excels and then christian misses a splash off the top so that darby's going to try to tag punk but starks pulls punk to the floor and punk chases him so he's not in the corner when darby gets there to make the tag but finally darby fights out against both of them and hits an actual hot tag and big pop and big comeback and after punk gives him a couple of bumps he does a bam bam bigelow cartwheel and a salute to the camera and again, they're pro and con. They're fucking, they're screaming. Back and forth, punk elbow off top rope. Crowd is ballistic. Starks gets back in, goes back and forth with punk. Darby gets back in, and somehow Starks hits his finish, gets a two count. Then Darby somehow, while they were up on the top rope, hit a reverse DDT off the top rope. That was a little bit of tightrope act for me, but I know the kids like it. And then Punk goes for a, uh, the GTS on Christian. Christian shit cans him to the floor, but goes out after him and Punk hits it on the floor. And in the ring, Darby's going to the top, but Dino crotches him behind the referee's back. 
Starks goes for his finish. Darby jackknifes him, but Starks rolls through and grabs the ropes again. One, two, three. Two weeks in a row, Starks wins by cheating. Perfect finish. Loved the tag match. Wasn't as good as last week, but certainly not as bad as pretty much every match on Wednesday night. Your thoughts, Brian? Yeah, good match. Really good main event match for the show. Fans were into it. And most importantly, it sets up more stuff with Ricky Starks and Punk. And also it aligns Starks for this match with the clear heels. Everything makes sense. And that's, again, that's the thing about this show on Saturday night. You don't have to dread, oh God, what am I going to have to skip through? What am I going to have to put up with? How am I going to figure out what's going on? It's a wrestling show. It makes sense from start to finish. Nobody's doing stupid, silly, obviously fake shit, forced comedy. Not everybody is allowed to be on the floor. Not everybody's allowed to fucking dive off the roof. Nobody is burying the referees needlessly. And they're, they're trying to impart a, a significant amount of time to main event matches that the people are going to want to watch for ratings, but still give some of the program over to matches that nobody's going to watch just because they're a dream match, but because the talent that they want to feature in the future needs matches to get over people first. Because that's the key to fucking wrestling that Tony Khan's been watching it for 30 years and has never figured out yet. You can't make dream matches until the talent is over and you don't get your talent over until they beat a bunch of people that the fans see them doing. If you... Like Tony signs these names that he knows and thinks are great and they're just swell and assumes that the rest of the goddamn entire audience across the length and breadth of this great United States of America knows every time that fucking Hanumashimu Wadamadfafi has goddamn won the Grand Prix title. And so... <laughs> People come into the company, and they've been doing this since the start, and we've been talking about it since the start. People come into company, and immediately they're put in main events when nobody knows who the fuck they are except the most hardcore faithful. And usually they get beat their first several times you see them. So the people that had never seen them before don't give a shit about them, don't take them seriously. And then after they've been around for a couple of years, they start getting matches against jobbers to win. They're not making that mistake on the program on Saturday night. So they're allowing some matches to go on just to get guys good solid wins, others to attract the viewers, and keeping a standard of logic of we're not going to all use furniture, we're not going to all fucking fight on the floor, we're not going to all bury the referee, and we're not going to all be a bunch of fucking gymnasts. So you can watch this program, and it doesn't get old nearly as quickly as every one of the others. That's my opinion. And that was AEW Collision, and we'll see what happens next week. Big tag team match. A lot to look forward to. And so if we're going to look forward to it, we better get out of this show so we can start looking forward to the next one, right? Start looking forward to the next one and start looking for Colin Thompson under what rock? Who knows? That's right. We're going to turn over every single rock until we find... If we have to turn Dwayne Johnson over and probe his rectum, we will find... That's slimy Colin Thompson. So tune in next week on the Jim Cornette Experience to find out what slimy comes out of the rock's ass. Until then, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.